The Adventurous Four by Enid Blyton. Three children ran down a rocky path to the seashore. Tom went first, a small wiry boy of twelve, his red hair gleaming in the sun. He looked round at the two girls following. Want any help, you two? Mary and Jill laughed in scorn. Don't be so silly, Tom, said Mary. We're as good as you any day when we're running over the rocks. The girls were twins and very like each other, with their heads of thick golden hair tied in plaits and their deep blue eyes. They often laughed at their brother Tom and said he should have been called Carrots because of his red hair. It was wartime and they were on holiday, staying in a little fishing village on the northeast coast of Scotland. Their father was in the Air Force and their mother was with them, knitting hard all day long in the garden of the little white house where they were staying. They had one great friend, Andy, the fisher boy. He was a big strong lad of 14 who just left school and was helping his father with his fishing. He knew everything about the sea, boats and fishing. Andy's marvellous, said Mary and Jill, a dozen times a day, and Tom agreed. Each day the children went to talk to their friend and to watch him bring in the catch of fish and clean it and pack it to be sent away. Andy sat on the side of his little boat and grinned at the three children running down the rocky path. He was mending a net. Let me help you, Andy, said Mary, and she took up the torn net. Her fingers were nimble, and she worked with Andy whilst the others lay on their backs on the hot sand. Andy, did you ask your father, said Tom. Aye, I did, said Andy. He says yes, if I work hard all the week. Andy, how lovely, said Jill in excitement. Do you mean to say your father will really lend you his sailing ship to take us for a trip to Little Island, asked Mary, hardly believing her ears. I never thought he'd say yes. I was rather surprised too, said Andy, but he knows I can handle the boat just as well as he can. We'll take plenty of food with us and we'll sail out to Little Island on Friday. We can spend two days and a night there, my father says. Oh, won't it be gorgeous, said Tom, sitting up and hugging his knees, all by ourselves, no grown-ups, a little island far over there to the east, and no one on it but ourselves. Too good to be true. On Thursday, the three children tired themselves out, taking food, rugs and other things down to the boat. Andy stared in astonishment at the amount of food. Are you wanting to feed an army? he asked. Six tins of soup, six tins of fruit, tins of tongue, chocolate, Nestle's milk, biscuits, cocoa, sugar, whatever's this. Oh, that's tinned sausages, said Tom. Tom's mad on sausages, said Jill. He'd like them for breakfast, dinner and tea. Look, will these rugs be enough, Andy? Yes, said Andy. Now mind you all wear warm clothes too. Skirts and jerseys, you girls, and shorts and jerseys for you, Tom. You haven't got trousers, have you? No, said Tom sadly. I don't suppose your father would lend me a pair, would he, Andy? He's only got the one pair, and his Sunday ones, said Andy. And I've only got the ones I'm wearing. Now, are you going to bring the gramophone? We can put it safely in the cabin if you like. Tom went back to it and soon brought it down to the boat with a packet of records. He also brought a tin of toffee and the camera. I'd like to take some pictures of the birds, he said. What time do we start, Andy? asked Jill, looking with pride at the sturdy little fishing boat that was going to take them on their adventure. Be down here at half past six, said Andy. I reckon we'll be at the island by about three in the afternoon then. Next morning at six o'clock, all three were dressed hurriedly. It was a magnificent day. The eastern sky was glowing red at dawn and now pink and gold. Their mother was awake. The children kissed her goodbye and ran down the rocky path to the beach. Andy was already there, but to the children's surprise, he looked rather grave. I'm thinking we shouldn't go, he said. Andy, whatever do you mean, they cried. Maybe you didn't see the morning sky, said Andy. It was as red as the geranium in our window. I'm thinking a storm will blow up today or tomorrow. Oh, don't be such a spoil sport, Andy, said Tom, climbing into the boat. What does a storm matter? We'll be on the island before it comes. If my father hadn't gone out in my uncle's ship to fish, I think he'd be stopping us from going, said Andy doubtfully. But maybe the storm will blow off to the east. Get in, then. I'm glad to see you've got your jerseys on. If the wind blows up, it will be cold tonight. I've got my bathing suit on underneath, said Jill. So have the others. Come on, Andy, push off. I'm simply longing to go. Andy pushed off. The boat grated over the stones and then rowed into the waves. Andy jumped in lightly. He and Tom took the oars. 
They didn't mean to put up the sail until they came out of the bay into the full sea. Now we're really off on our adventure, said Jill, really off. But she didn't know what an extraordinary adventure it was going to be. As soon as the boat was clear of the bay, Andy put up the sail. It was a pretty brown one, like the sails of all the other fishing boats in the village. It billowed out in the breeze and the boat sped along. The boys shipped the oars. I'll steer, said Tom, and he took the tiller. The sail flapped and spray flew up from under the bows of the boat. We go northeast, said Andy. This is simply gorgeous, said Jill, lying on a rug on the deck, feeling the spray splash on her hot face and arms every now and again. How I do love to feel the boat bobbing up and down, up and down all the time. Can I have a turn at the tiller soon, Tom? Everybody can, said Tom. The sailing boat simply flew over the water. We should be at Little Island before three o'clock if we go on like this, said Andy. The morning slid on. The sun rose higher and higher, and at noon it was so hot that everyone put on sun hats. The wind was still strong and whipped the tops from the waves as the boat flew along. Queer colour the sky is getting over yonder, said Andy, nodding his head to the west. They all looked. It's sort of coppery, said Tom. There's a storm blowing up, said Andy, sniffing the air like a dog. I can smell it. Then a strange thing happened. The wind, which had been blowing very strongly indeed, dropped completely. The little fishing boat stopped running in front of the wind and rowed silently over the waves, as if she were at anchor. I say, that's funny, said Tom. Not a bit of breeze now. Andy will never get to the island if we don't get some wind. Shall we row? No, said Andy, his face rather pale under its dark brown. No, Tom. You'd get plenty of wind in a minute. More than we want. We must take in some of the sail. There was a queer humming noise in the air that seemed to come from nowhere at all. The world went dark, and great spots of rain fell. It's coming now, said Andy. Help me with the sail, Tom. Take the tiller, Jill. Keep her heading that way, the way we've been going. Pull, Tom, pull. They pulled at the big brown sail, but before they'd done what they wanted to, the storm broke. A great crash of thunder came from the black cloud, and a flash of lightning split the sky in half. Andy yelled to the girls, Get down into the cabin, quick, and shut the door and stay there. Oh, let's be here, cried Jill, but Andy looked so stern and commanding that they didn't dare to disobey. They almost fell into the cabin and shut the door. Outside, the wind seemed to get a voice, a voice that howled and wailed and lashed the sea into enormous waves that sent the little boat half over every time. There was a crash as the packet of records fell down. Blow, cried Jill, they'll all be broken. So they were, all but one. It was very sad. The girls carefully put the one whole record into a safe place and wondered what the boys would say when they knew, but it couldn't be helped. Up above, on the deck, the two boys struggled with the wind and the sea. What are you trying to do, yelled Tom, who was at the tiller. Take in all the sail, shouted back Andy. We can't go on like this, we'll be over. But he didn't need to bother, for suddenly the sail ripped itself off the mast, flapped wildly for a second, and then sped away into the sky. It was gone. Only a little rag was left, wriggling madly in the wind. Andy said nothing. He took the tiller with Tom, and together the boys faced the storm. Stinging rain fell every now and again, and the boys bent their heads to it, shut their eyes. The wind lashed them, and the spray whipped them. If this was an adventure, there was a great deal too much of it. Do you think we're all right, Andy? shouted Tom. Are we near the island? I reckon we've passed it, yelled back Andy. At the rate we've been going, we'd have been there by now. Goodness knows where we are. Tom stared at Andy in silence. Past the island? A storm behind them? No sail? What were they going to do? For a long time, the boat went on and on, its little rag of a sail still flapping. I should think the wind's almost a hurricane, isn't it? yelled Tom. Pretty near, shouted Andy, but it's blowing itself out now. But sure enough, it was. Just as suddenly as it had come, the storm flew off. A sheet of bright blue sky appeared in the west and swiftly grew bigger as the great cloud flew to the east. The world grew light again. The rain stopped, the wind died down to a breeze, and the boat no longer seemed to climb up and down steep hills. The cabin door opened and two green faces looked out sadly. We've been awfully seasick down here, said Jill. 
It was dreadful. What a frightful storm, said Mary. Are we nearly at the island? We've passed it, Andy says, said Tom gloomily. We don't know where we are. Look, the sail's gone, said Mary, shocked. What are we to do for a sail? Hey, there's an old one down in the cabin, said Andy. Fetch it, will you? And I'll see if I can do something with it. Andy took the old sail and had a good look at it. He thought he could rig it with Tom's help. I've heard my father say there's some desolate rocky islands up away to the north of Little Island, said Andy, his wet jersey steaming in the hot sunshine. We'll make for those. At last, the old sail was flying in the breeze. Andy headed due north. It was about five o'clock now, and all the children were very hungry. Jill and Mary had forgotten their seasickness and went below to get some food. Soon they were all eating heartily and felt much better. The boat sailed on to the north. The sun slipped low into the west, and the boat's shadow lay purple on the sea. It was a beautiful evening. Look, gulls, said Andy at last. Maybe we're nearing land. Can't see any, though. We better anchor for the night, I should think. And then the children got a great shock. There was no anchor. Andy stared in horror. How could he possibly have forgotten that his father had warned him to take the old anchor because he was lending Andy's uncle his own? How could he have forgotten? Now they couldn't anchor their ship. Now they would have to ride on the sea until they came to land, and in the night they might strike a rock. Jill and Mary were tired out. Andy ordered them to go below and rest. You'd better go too, Tom, he said. You'll have to come up and take your turn on the deck tonight, and you'd better get a nap whilst you can. But I don't want to, said Tom. I should be able to keep awake all right. Go below, Tom, said Andy, in the kind of voice that had to be obeyed. Andy stayed alone on deck. Night fell darkly on the waters. The moon sailed into the sky, but clouds kept hiding her light. First the sea was gleaming silver, then it was black, then it was silver again. Andy wished he could see something besides the sea, but there was nothing. The boy stayed on deck until midnight. After a while, he whistled to Tom. Tom awoke. Coming, he said sleepily and went up on deck. He shivered and Andy threw a rug round him. Keep her heading straight, he said. Give me a call if you see anything. It was queer up on deck all alone. The old sail flapped and creaked a little. Tom couldn't see anything at all. He strained his eyes to try and pierce through the darkness, but except for the gleaming white top of a nearby wave now and then, he could see nothing. But he could hear something, quite suddenly. It sounded like crashing waves. The moon came sliding out from a cloud for a second before it disappeared again, and in that tiny space of time, Tom saw something that gave him a shock. The sea was breaking over big rocks just ahead, Andy, Andy, yelled Tom, wrenching the tiller round. Rocks ahead. Andy came tumbling up the steps, wide awake at once. He took the tiller, and then came a grating noise and a long groan from the ship. She was on the rocks. She'd run straight onto them, and there she lay, groaning, half over, slanting so much that the girls in the little cabin were thrown out of the bunk. Hold on, Tom, shouted Andy, clutching at Tom, who seemed about to slide overboard. Hold on, she's settling. The ship did settle. She seemed to be wedged between two rocks that were holding her tightly, all on the slant. Waves splashed over one side of her deck. For a few minutes, the children hardly dared to breathe, and then Andy spoke. She's fast. She may have a hole in her bottom, but she won't sink while she's held like this. We must wait till dawn. So they waited, clinging uncomfortably to the slanting sides of the ship. Dawn was not far off, and in the golden light of the early sun they saw something not far off that made them shout for joy. Land ho! they yelled, and would have danced in delight if only the deck had not been so slanting. A sandy shore stretched to a rocky cliff. It was an island of some sort, desolate, rocky and lonely, but it was at least land. We'll have to swim for it. It's not very far. Once we're clear of these rocks we'll be all right. Andy held out his hand to Mary. Tom helped Jill. Half, half wading, half swimming, they made their way over and between the reef of rocks and paddled to shore. Well, said Andy, if we've got to be stranded here for a time, we must get out of our ship everything that's in her. 
Thank goodness we've got a certain amount of food and some rugs. Come on, Tom. You got to stay halfway to the boat in that shallow water, and we'll carry things over to you on the rocks. Then you can take them back to shore. And so they began to empty the ship of all it held. Food, rugs, gramophone, camera, field glasses, stool, table, tools, crockery, kettle, matches, little stove, everything. It took a long time, but before they'd finished, the tide had risen and the decks were awash. The cabin was full of water. We can't do anything any more, said Andy. Let's go and have a rest and something to eat. I'm simply starving. It was a rather solemn set of children who sat down on the shore to eat breakfast. Andy stared out at their wrecked ship and wrinkled his forehead. Well, we're in a nice fix. But we'll forget it for a minute and enjoy our breakfast. We'll eat all the food that might go bad. There's that open jar of potted meat, Tom, that we began last night. And what about something hot to drink? Look, I've brought the matches with me, wrapped in this oil skin so they won't get wet. We can't get the stove going till we get a tin of oil out of the locker in the boat. We forgot that, so we'd better make a fire on the beach. Tom and Jill collected sticks, and soon there was a fine fire going. Andy went off up the cliff to see if he could find a stream to fill the kettle. He had to go a good way before he found a spring running down the little hill in the distance. He filled the kettle and went back to the cove. The kettle soon boiled and the children made thick cocoa. They added the tin milk to it and drank with enjoyment. The twins, who were cold, felt warmed up at once. Their clothes were still wet, and although the sun now shone down hotly, they felt chilly. And he had laid out the rugs in the sun. He felt them. They were almost dry. We'd better get off our wet things and hang them on the bushes to dry. We'll roll ourselves in these rugs and lie down in the sheltered corner over there by the cliff in the sun and sleep off our bad night. So, in three or four minutes, all that could be seen of the children were four tightly rolled bundles lying peacefully asleep in the sunshine, in a cosy corner of the beach. Their damp clothes were spread out on bushes to dry, and were already steaming in the sun. Andy awoke first. He threw off his rug and went to feel his clothes on the bush. They were perfectly dry, and he put them on. And then he went to the big pile of things that they'd taken from the ship. He looked among them and found a fishing line. He hunted about for a sandworm, baited his hook and clambered out onto the rocks where the deep water swirled around him. He lowered his line into the water and in ten minutes he'd caught his first fish and was baiting the line again. Tom awoke next. He sat up on the sand, astonished to hear the sea so close. Then he remembered all that had happened and leapt to his feet. He awoke the girls and they put on their warm clothes. Andy's getting our dinner, said Jill. I suppose you're feeling as hungry as usual. I could eat a whale, said Tom, and he really felt as if he could. It was fun cooking the fish over a fire. It smelt delicious. There was no bread left, so the children had to eat the fish by itself, but they were so hungry that they didn't mind at all. It's about two o'clock in the afternoon, said Andy, looking at the sun. Now the first thing to do is to find a good place to sleep for the night. Then we'd better explore the island if we've time. The food we've got with us won't last a great while, but at any rate we can always get fish and I expect we'll find some berries we can eat too. How will anyone know we're here? asked Jill. We shall have to put up some sort of sign, shan't we, to show any passing ship or steamer that we're here. Yes, I've been thinking about that. I'll take down the ship's sail, and we'll tie it to a tree on the top of the cliff. That'll be a fine signal. Good idea, said Tom. It will flap in the wind and be seen for miles. We'll find a sleeping place for the night before we do that. It looks like rain again now. See that low cloud over there? We don't want to be soaked in our sleep. We'll have to rig up a tent of some sort. A tent, Andy, said Tom. Wherever will we get a tent from? Buy it from a shop, I suppose. I'm going to get the old sail off the boat, said Andy. We can use it for a signal by day and a tent by night. It's big enough to cover us all quite well. Andy, you have got good ideas, said Jill. I should never have thought of that. Well, shall we go back then and help you? No. You stay here with Tom and help him build a kind of tent house that we can just drape the sail over. You want some stout branches stuck well into the ground. I'll go and get the sail. Eight willing hands helped to arrange the big brown sail over the circle of sticks stuck firmly in the ground. The weight of the sail kept it down, and when the children had finished, they'd made a kind of round brown tent with no doorway. We'll gather a nice pile of heather and put it inside the tent to lie on, said Tom. And with our rugs too, we shall be as cosy and warm as toast. 
In fact, we may be much too hot. Well, if we are, we'll just lift up one side of the tent and let the breeze blow in, said Jill. There isn't time to explore the island now, said Andy, looking in surprise at the sinking sun. We've, we've taken ages over the tent. We'll go all over the island tomorrow. That will be fun, said Mary. I wonder what we'll find. All the children slept soundly that night, and even when the clouds piled up over the moon and a sharp downpour of rain came, they didn't wake. The raindrops pattered over the tent, but didn't soak through to the sleeping children. They awoke when the sun was fairly high, about eight o'clock in the morning. Andy, as usual, awoke first and rolled out of the tent quietly. But he'd woken Tom, and when the boy yawned loudly, the girls awoke too. It was a fine sunny morning with clouds scudding across the sky like big pieces of cotton wool. The first thing, of course, was breakfast. But it had to be caught, so Andy and Tom went fishing on the rocks and the girls managed to catch about 20 large prawns in a pool on the sandy shore. They cooked their catch and ate hungrily. I do feel dirty, said Jill. I shall go and wash at the spring. Coming, Mary? Yes, said Mary, and I vote we all have a bathe today. That will clean us up a bit too. They all felt cleaner after a rinse and a splash in the spring. Tom and Andy made the fixing of the signal their next job. They found a good tree. At least it was a good one for their purpose, for it had been struck by lightning at one time and now stood straight and bare on the top of the cliff. It took the two boys about an hour to climb the tree and fix the sail signal. It flapped out well in the breeze, and Andy was sure it could be seen from a great distance. They climbed down again and went back to the girls. What about exploring the island now, asked Tom. I feel just like a good walk. Well, the island may be too small for a good walk, said Andy. We'll just see. Ready, you girls? They were all ready for their walk. First they climbed the hill and stood on the top, looking to see what they could spy. From the top of the hill they could see all around their island, and certainly it wasn't very big, only about a mile and a half long and about a mile wide. They could see the blue water all around it but not far off were other islands. They lay in the sea, blue and misty in the distance. But as far as the children could see, there were no houses or buildings of any kind on them. They seemed as desolate and as lonely as their own island. I don't believe a single soul lives here on these islands, said Andy, his face rather grave. Come on, let's go down to this side of the hill. We may as well find out all there is to know. As they went down the hill and came to the level ground again, Tom stopped in astonishment. Look, he said, potato plants. The children looked, and sure enough, growing completely wild around them were plants that looked exactly like potatoes. Andy pulled one up, and there, clinging to the roots, were a dozen or more small white potatoes. That's queer, said Andy, staring around. At some time or other, there must have been people living here, and they grew potatoes. Some have seeded themselves and grown wild, but the thing is, if people lived here... Where did they live? But they must have lived somewhere. How queer, said Tom, looking all around as if he expected a house to spring from the ground. And then Jill gave a shout. I believe I can see the chimney of a house. Look, where the ground dips down suddenly over there. The others looked. They saw that the ground did suddenly dip down into a kind of hollow, well protected from the wind, just the place where people might build a house. They tore over the rocky ground to the dip, expecting they hardly knew what, and what a surprise they got when at last they reached the hollow and looked down into it. The four children stood at the top of the steep dip. The hollow ran right down to the sea, and in it were a cluster of small buildings. But what strange buildings. Nothing but ruins, said Tom in astonishment. Whatever happened to make the houses and sheds fall to pieces like that? I think I know, said Andy. A year or two ago, there came a great storm to these parts. I think the sea came into this hollow and battered the farm to bits. The four children gazed down at the poor hollow house and outbuildings. A little farm had once been there, a poor farm maybe, trying to grow a few potatoes in the rocky ground to keep a few goats or cows and to take from the sea enough fish to live on. Let's go down into the hollow and have a look. So down into the dip they scrambled and wandered round the ruined buildings. Nothing had been left. All the furniture had been taken away and even the gates and doors were removed. 
They wandered about and at last came to a little wooden shack where perhaps a cow or two had been kept in the winter. For some reason it had escaped being beaten by the waves and still stood upright, its one window broken and its floor covered with a creeping weed. Andy looked at it carefully. Hey, this wouldn't be a bad place to make into a little house for ourselves, he said. Oh yes, said Tom in delight. Let's make this our house. That would be fun. Then we could leave the sail flapping for our signal all the time. We shall have to bring all our things here and make it a bit home-like, and all those weeds will have to be cleared. Yes, and we'll spread the floor with clean sand, said Jill. Listen, you boys, clear up the weeds for us, and Mary and I will go to that old potato field and find the biggest potatoes we can and cook them in their jackets for lunch. Good idea, said Tom, feeling hungry at once. Come on, Andy, let's start and clean up the place now. We can't do much till that's done. The two boys set to work. Andy made a rough fireplace just outside the shack with stones from the hearth of the ruined farmhouse. We can't have the fire inside because this shack has no chimney, he said, and we'd be choked with the smoke. Anyway, I've made the fireplace out of the wind and we ought to be able to cook all right on it. Mary, you can bake the potatoes there once the stones get hot. Tom, get some sticks and start a fire. Mary and Jill peeped inside the shack. It looked clean and tidy now, though very bare. We'll have to get heaps of heather and bracken in for beds again, said Jill, just as we did for our tent. Won't it be a nice little house? We must bring a little table here and a stool and all the cups and things. It will make it seem like home. Their lunch was potatoes and chocolates with plenty of cold spring water. Tom could have eaten three times as much, but he had to be content with five large potatoes and a whole bar of chocolate. We'll have fish for tonight, promised Andy. The water round about this island is thick with fish. We'll always have plenty to eat so long as we don't get tired of fish. We'll hunt for shellfish too. After their dinner, the children separated. The girls were to go to the nearest patch of heather and bracken to bring in armfuls for beds. The boys were to make journeys to and from the tent and bring in all their belongings. When the tide's down tonight, I'll get the tin of oil out of the locker of the boat, said Andy. We can cook over the stove then, as well as over the fire if we want to. The children were very busy that afternoon. Mary and Jill got enough heather and bracken to make two beds, one at each side of the shack. They piled the bracken on the floor first, and then the softer heather on top. They then spread each bed with a rug, and put another rug neatly folded up to be used as a blanket at night. They ate their supper, sitting outside the open doorway of the shack, looking out to the evening sea. The gulls called high in the air, and the splash of the little white edge waves came to them every now and again. Now, we'll turn in, said Andy with a yawn. It'll be fun to sleep in our little house for the first time. Come on, girls, leave the washing up till morning. We're all very tired. The next day, the children went to make sure that their sail signal was still safely tied to the signal tree at the top of the cliff. It was. It flapped there steadily, a signal to any passing ship that there were people on the island who needed help. Suppose no help comes, said Tom. Shall we have to stay here all winter? Yes, unless you'd like to try to swim dozens of miles back home, said Andy. The children looked at one another. Stay there for the winter. It was not a pleasant thought. Don't look so gloomy. We may be rescued any day, and maybe there are people living on one of the other islands. I think perhaps at a very low tide we could cross to the next island by that line of rocks over there and explore that. We may find dozens of people for all we know. They went to see if their boat was still held fast between the two rocks. Yes, there it was, all on one side, the tide washing right over its decks. Perhaps an extra strong tide might lift it off the rocks, said Andy. If only it would, we could mend it. I tried to sail back home again. Well, there's nothing left in the boat that could be taken away now, said Tom. I really think we've got everything movable, ropes, nets, even the oars. There was nothing to do that afternoon except bathe and fish. The little shack was finished. There was nothing more to add to it. They could do nothing with their wrecked boat. It was of no use going for a ramble, for the island was so small. So Tom suggested a bathe first and fishing afterwards. It was warm in the sunshiny sea. They swam through the big waves and splashed about lazily. Then they came out of the sea and lay in the sun to dry. After that, the boys sat on the rocks to fish and the girls went to hunt for prawns, shrimps and shellfish. The tide was very low that evening. The wind had completely dropped and the sea was almost calm, as nearly calm as it ever could be on that rough rocky coast. The children stood on the rocky ledge, looking north 
where the other islands lay, blue with a summery mist. They really look as if they're just floating on the water, said Jill, dreamily. They do look lovely. I wish we could visit them. Well, it would be quite easy if we chose low tide, said Andy, pointing to the line of rocks that were now uncovered and which seemed to lead in a crooked line to the next island. I'd like to go across those rocks tomorrow morning when the tide is low again. We could take food for the day and see what was on the next island and climb back across the rocks at low tide tomorrow night. The next morning, they ran to see if the tide had uncovered the rocks again. Yes, there they stretched, grey and green, some quite bare, some covered with seaweed. Come on, said Andy. We'd better go now before the tide turns. They leapt down from the ledge and ran to the sandy shore. They jumped up to the rocks and they began to make their way carefully over them. Some were so slippery that once or twice the children nearly fell into the deep pools. These pools looked exciting. Quite big fish swam in there, and Annie said big edible crabs would be sure to be there. But we've no time for fishing about here. We shall be caught by the tide if we don't make haste. Sure enough, the tide was on the turn. But before it could reach the jagged line of rocks over which the children were climbing, they'd come to the end of them and waded through a pool to the sandy shore of the next island. They turned to climb the cliffs and had a big surprise. Look, caves, said Tom, pointing to big black openings in the cliff. Look at them, caves of all kinds and sizes and shapes. Let's have a look at them. They made their way to the first cave and just outside it Andy stopped and stared at something in the sand. What's up? said Tom. That, said Andy, and he pointed to a cigarette end that lay rolling a little in the breeze. A cigarette end, said Tom, looking all around as if he were looking for the one who'd smoked it. Well, somebody's been here all right, and not very long ago either, but there's not a single house on this island, ruined or whole. Perhaps the people live in these caves, said Jill, looking half timidly at the first one. We'll go in and see, said Andy. He pulled a roll of oilskin from his pocket, and out of it took a half candle and a box of matches. He lighted the candle, and then... Leading the way, he stepped into the first cave. The others followed him. The floor was thick with silvery sand and the walls of the cave were high and smooth. It ran back a long way and then narrowed into an archway. Through this, the children went into another cave, which narrowed into a passage, whose roof was at times so low they had bumped their heads against it. And then they came to the Round Cave, which was the name they at once gave the last strange cave. It was almost perfectly round, and as the floor slanted towards the middle, it felt like being inside a hollow ball. But it wasn't the roundness of the cave that startled the four children. It was what it held. Piled high everywhere were boxes, sacks and big tin chests with strange words on them. Some piles reached the roof of the cave. Others reached halfway. Golly, look at that, said Tom, in the greatest astonishment. Whatever's in all these boxes and things, and why are they here? The little flame of the candle flickered on the strange array in the cave. Andy set the candle gently down on a flat piece of rock and pulled the neck of thick brown sack undone. It was lined with coarse blue paper inside. He undid that and then gave a low cry of surprise. Sugar! I was expecting treasure or something, and it's sugar! I wonder what's in the other sacks and boxes. Some the children couldn't force open, but others were already opened, as if someone had taken from them some of the contents. The boxes were full of tins. There were tins of soup, meat, vegetables, fruit, sardines, everything one could think of. There was a chest of flour, a chest of tea, tins of salt, even tins of butter and lard, well sealed and airtight. Andy, I really don't understand this, said Jill in a puzzled voice. How did all these come here? And who do you suppose they belong to? As far as we know, there isn't a single person on the island. I don't know any more than you do, Jill. It's like a dream. But anyway, we shan't need to starve whilst there's all this food stored here. The children each chose what they thought they would like to take away. Sugar, they wanted, and salt. The tin butter would be splendid, and any tins of meat and fruit. Jill thought she might be able to make some rolls of bread with the flour. Each child carried quite a heavy load down the narrow passage that led from the round cave to the shore cave. When they reached the open air, Tom took a deep breath and set down his load. My goodness, it was stuffy up there, he said. What puzzles me is why it wasn't more stuffy than it was, said Andy. Air must get into the round cave through some hole that we didn't see. 
Pack up your things, Tom. The tide's coming in. We can't stay on this beach. The sea will reach the cave before long. It's all right for about ten minutes, said Tom, pulling a fat little notebook from his pocket. I just want to jot down a list of all the things we've taken, in case we eat them up and then forget what we had. Tom's always so honest, said Jill. Well, I'll tell you the things, Tom, and you can write them down. Until the tide went out that night, the children were prisoners on the second island, for there was no way to get back to their own island except by the line of rocks. This was now completely covered by the tide, and great showers of spray were sent high into the air as the water crashed against the rocks over which they'd clambered early that day. Anyone got a tin opener? asked Tom. Andy had. In Andy's pockets there was almost anything that anyone could possibly want, from tin tacks to toffee. You'd better open a tin, I suppose, said Andy with a grin. I've watched you sticking your finger into the sugar packet a dozen times already. Open a tin of tongue and perhaps you won't feel so hungry for sugar. They all feasted on the tongue, which was really delicious. They felt very thirsty afterwards. Why don't we open a tin of pineapple, said Tom at last. The chunks will be lovely and juicy and we can all have a drink of the juice in the tin too. So a tin of pineapple was opened. Both tins were carefully buried by the children, for although the island seemed quite lonely and deserted, they could not bear to make it ugly by leaving empty tins about. How did all that food come to be in the round cave? said Jill. Could it have been there for years, do you suppose, and have been forgotten? No, it hasn't been there for very long. The sugar was soft, and sugar goes hard if it's thawed for long. That cigarette end we found too, that had been smoked not more than a week or two ago or the wind would have blown it into bits. Andy, don't you think it would be a good idea to stay on this island and live here instead of going back to our own island, asked Mary. No, I don't, said Andy at once. You forgot we've left a signal on our island and if any ship sees it and calls for us, we might be on this island unable to be rescued because the tide was high and we couldn't get back. But couldn't we tie the signal up somewhere on this island, said Tom. No, no ship could get us here. The island is almost surrounded by a reef of the worst rocks I've seen. Look at them right out there. The children looked. Andy was right. A jagged line of rocks ran some way out from the coast. Between the rocks and the coast, the sea lay trapped in a kind of big lagoon or lake, calm and smooth. Tom frowned and looked puzzled. Well, if no ship can get in to rescue us if we stay on this island, he said, how in the world did one get in to land all that food in the cave? Andy stared at Tom and looked as puzzled as Tom did. Yes, that's odd, he said. Mary stood up and tried to see what the next island was like. It looked much bigger than the first two. There was no line of rock stretching to it, but only an unbroken spread of blue water. To get to the third island, they would have to swim or use a boat. Do you think we'd better leave a note in the cave to say that we're on the first island and would like to be rescued, said Tom. The people may come back at any time and we should go away in their boat. Andy shook his head. I think we won't leave a note or anything else to show we've been here, he said. There's something a bit mysterious about all this, and if there's a secret going on, we'd better keep out of it till we know what it is. Oh, Andy, whatever do you mean, cried Mary. I don't know what I mean. It's just a feeling I have, that's all. Well, Andy, what about all our footmarks around the cave, said Tom. The tide will wash all those away, said Andy. There's nothing that'll show we've been there. Except that some of the food is missing, said Mary. You've forgotten that, Andy. No, no, I haven't, said Andy. There's so much in that cave that I don't think anyone will miss the little we've taken. Nobody would think that any strangers would ever visit that cave. The tide went down and the line of rocks began to show. The children clambered down to the shore to go back to their own island. They had tied to their backs the food they'd taken, and Andy told everyone to be very careful. We don't want to lose our food in a deep pool, he said, so don't rush along so fast, Tom. You're always in such a hurry. They got back to their little hut at last, and all of them were delighted to see it. It really seemed like coming home. They sat down on their beds, tired out. But Tom was not going to bed without his supper. He wanted hot soup, more tongue, and a tin of peaches. So the stove had to be lit and Tom was sent to fill the kettle. All the children enjoyed the meal, although they were so sleepy they could hardly bother to clear up afterwards. The first stars were in the sky as they flung themselves onto their beds. It's awfully early to go to bed, murmured Jill sleepily, but I can't keep awake another minute. She fell asleep at once. So did Mary. Tom blew out the stove and lay down too. Andy sat up for a while, looking out towards the second island and wondering about a lot of things. Then he, too, lay down and fell asleep. But not for long. 
a strange and curious noise awoke him. Tom, wake up, said Andy. Listen to this noise. What is it? Tom woke and listened. It's a motorbike, he said, half asleep. Don't be a fathead, said Andy. Motorbike on this island. You're dreaming. Come on, wake up. I tell you, there's a jolly queer noise. The noise itself hummed away into silence. The gulls screamed but soon became quiet. Andy sat and listened a little longer and then, as no more noise came, lay down again. Odder and odder, said Andy to himself. We seem to have come to some most mysterious islands and I'm going to find out what's happening, or my name isn't Andy. The next day the children talked about the queer noise that Andy had heard. I tell you it sounded exactly like a motorbike, Tom said firmly, and nothing would make him admit that it wasn't. If I didn't know there couldn't possibly be any landing ground on these rocky islands, I might have thought the noise was made by an aeroplane, said Andy thoughtfully. But that's silly. Why would an aeroplane come here? And where would it land? It might be a motorboat, perhaps, said Jill suddenly. Yes, I believe it was, said Andy. It had a throbbing sound that a motor makes. Now, now what's a motorboat doing here? But anyway, it means that we can be rescued. Of course, said Tom. Well, let's go and find the motorboat. What a surprise they'll get when suddenly they see us. They'll wonder wherever we've come from. Tom, don't be in such a great hurry. I think there's something funny going on here, and before we show ourselves, we'd better find out if we shall be welcome. Oh? said Tom, surprised. The girls looked rather alarmed. What do you mean, something funny? said Jill. I don't know, but what we'll do is to see where that motorboat is. It won't have seen our signal because it came in the night, and we know it's not anywhere this side of the island, or we'd have seen it this morning. I vote we go to that rocky ledge where we got the best view of the second island and see if by any chance a boat has been able to get through the reef of rocks and sail into that quiet lagoon inside. The four children made their way to the high rocky ledge. Andy made them lie down flat and wriggle like red Indians as they reached it. Better not let ourselves be seen if anyone is down there, he whispered. So, as flat as snakes, they wormed their way to the rocky ledge, and when they got there, they had the biggest surprise of their lives. In the quiet water that lay outside the second island was a large and powerful seaplane. Phew, look at that, whispered Andy. I never thought of a seaplane. What a very extraordinary thing. Let's get up and shout and wave, begged Jill. I'm sure they would love to rescue us. Haven't you seen the sign on the wings? asked Tom in a curiously angry voice. The girls looked. The sign of the Nazi swastika was painted on each wing. The sign of the German enemy, the foe of half the world. Golly, said Mary, and she drew a deep breath. Enemies? Using these islands, do they belong to them? Of course not. But they're using them as a kind of base for something. Seaplanes, perhaps? Well, what are we going to do? asked Tom. We shall have to think. One thing is certain, we won't show ourselves until we find out a little more. We don't want to be taken prisoner. That's what the food was for, then. The people who come here, said Jill. I suppose the seaplanes come over here for food and petrol. It's a good idea. How I wish we could get away and tell my father about it. He'd know what to do. I guess he'd clean up this place, whatever it's used for. I say, hadn't we better take down our signal whilst the seaplane is here, asked Jill. If it happens to see it, the enemy will know there are people on this island. And what about the fishing boat? That might be seen too. I don't think so, said Andy. That's well hidden between those rocks, but the signal had certainly better come down. Come on, Tom, we'll take it down now. We'll come with you, said the girls, but Andy shook his head. No, from now on somebody must keep watch on that seaplane. So the two girls were left behind whilst the boys ran across the island to take down their flapping signal. I don't know where in the world we should hide if we were discovered and hunted for, said Andy, rolling up the sail. There isn't a single place here to hide away in, not a cave or anything. Tom felt rather uncomfortable. He didn't want to be hunted for on that bare island. I wish we could see how many men there are in that seaplane, he said. And what are they doing, and everything? Where are your field glasses? said Andy suddenly. They would be just the thing to use. We could see everything as clearly as could be then. And my camera too, said Tom. What about my camera? We could take some photographs of the seaplane, then everyone would have to believe us when we got back. If we ever do get back. That's a fine idea, said Andy. Golly, if we could take some pictures of that seaplane with a swastika showing up clearly, there wouldn't be the least bit of doubt about our story when we got home. 
Tom, let's go and get your glasses and your camera straight away. They dumped the sail into a bush and ran to the shack. They took Tom's field glasses and picked up the camera to see if it needed a new film. No, there was a new one inside. Better not use up all the film on the seaplane. There might be other interesting and extraordinary things to photograph. You never know. Oh, I've got three or four films, said Tom. Come on, let's go back to the girls and see what they have to report. The girls were very glad indeed to see the boys. They had a lot to tell. Andy, Tom, as soon as you'd gone, the men in the seaplane put out a funny little round sort of boat, said Jill in excitement, and they paddled to shore in it and went to our cave. What a good thing the sea had washed away all our footprints. Uh, it was indeed. Tom, give me the field glasses. I want to have a look through them. Andy stared through the powerful glasses. There seems to be someone in a seaplane, and look, there are some men coming from the cave. Andy could see them clearly through his field glasses, and the others could see them too, though not so well, of course. They've gone to get food from the cave, and I guess there's a store of petrol somewhere else for them to get when they want to. Food and petrol, just what I thought. Using these islands saves their own country's stores. My word, we have stumbled onto something queer. The men entered their rubber boat and rowed back to the seaplane. Twice more they went back to the cave, and then they climbed up into the plane and disappeared. I'm getting awfully hungry, said Tom at last. Can't we go and get something to eat? Aye, I'll stay here and keep watch, and you and the girls can go and get your dinner. Don't light a fire, whatever you do. The animal will see the smoke. Use the stove if you want to cook anything, and bring me something to eat and drink later. Right, said Tom, and he and the girls wriggled off the high ledge. They stood upright as soon as they were out of sight of the seaplane and tore to their shack. They ate a hurried meal and didn't cook anything at all. They made up a dinner packet for Andy and set off to take it to him. But halfway there they heard a noise. They stopped at once and listened. It's the seaplane going off, cried Tom. And then the sound came again, more loudly than ever. Look, it's there, cried Jill. Drop flat to the ground or we'll be seen. Jill had seen the seaplane just rising into the air over the cliff. The three children dropped flat to the ground and lay there perfectly still. The seaplane roared over their island, rose higher, and at last was nothing but a speck in the sky. The children were very glad that the seaplane had gone. It's a jolly good thing our signal was taken down before it flew over the island, said Andy, eating the foods that the others had brought him. Andy, do you think there's anything to be seen over on the other islands, asked Tom. Now, there may be. I think we ought to try and find out. That third island looks a peculiar shape to me, very long indeed, but very narrow. On the other side of it might be a fine natural harbour for seaplanes. There may be heaps there. Well, we've only heard one so far, said Tom. It doesn't seem as if they're very busy, if there are lots over there. No, you're right, Tom. Well, what about going to see what we can find? I don't, I don't quite know how we'll get to the third island. I'll have to swim, I think. I don't believe the girls could swim that far. I don't think I could, said Jill, remembering the long stretch of sea between the second and third islands. Shall we go tomorrow? asked Tom eagerly. We could cross to the second island at low tide in the morning and then swim across to the third island. We could carry a little food with us, wrapped in your oil skin. Yes, we could do that, said Andy. A great feeling of excitement came over the children, a feeling as if some big unknown secret was going to be theirs. Jill shivered a little. It was almost too exciting. There's one thing I'm worried about said Andy. Just suppose we are discovered by any chance. We must find some hiding place. Well, there simply isn't any on this island, said Tom. So we must hope we won't be discovered. Nothing more happened that day. No seaplane came to the calm harbour in the waters of the second island. No sound but the seagulls came through the air. It was a lovely day and the children enjoyed themselves bathing and sunning their brown bodies. Thanks to the store of food they discovered on the second island, they had plenty to eat. Andy caught some nice little fish and Jill fried them in the tin butter. We are really very well off now, said Tom, who, as usual, was thoroughly enjoying his meal. We'll take uh, another exciting lot of tins away from the round cave next time. I saw some baked beans in tomato sauce. I should like those. The children took turns at keeping watch on the second island from the rocky ledge, but nothing was to be seen at all. They went to bed early because the boys would have rather a hard and long day the next day. We shall have to clamber over the next line of rocks first, said Andy, and then we must cross the island and swim to the third one. We'll have to be back on the second island in time to clamber over the rocks at the next low tide. You girls mustn't worry about us. We'll be back all right. I do wish we were going too, said Jill. Don't you think Mary and I could climb over the rocks to the second island and wait for you there? There are lots of bilberries there that we could pick. 
They're lovely and sweet now. All right, said Andy. Well, just keep a watch for any seaplane arriving. Lie down flat under a bush or something if you hear one. You mustn't be seen. All right, said Mary. You can trust us to do that. So the next morning, the four children once again climbed over the line of slippery rocks at low tide. The boys had on only their bathing suits. Andy had tied his oilskin packet safely to his shoulders, and in it was plenty of food for the day. All four went across the second island, over the heather and bracken to where they could see the third island. It lay in the sea before them like a long blue and brown snake. Do you really think you can swim so far, Tom? asked Mary doubtfully as she looked at the wide spread of water between the second island and the third. Of course, said Tom. All the same, the distance was further than he'd ever swum before. Well, goodbye for the present, said Andy to the girls. We'll get down to the shore here, wade out as far as we can, and then swim. Have you got Tom's field glasses, Jill? Good. You can watch us through them all the way to the third island. The boys went down to the shore, waded into the water, and then, when they were out of their depth, began to swim. Andy was by far the stronger swimmer, but he kept close to Tom, just in case the younger boy got into difficulties. On and on they swam, using the breaststroke, because Andy said it was the least tiring. When Tom began to pant a little, halfway across, Andy spoke to him. Let's do a spot of floating, Tom. That'll rest us a little. It's a long way. The two boys lay on their backs in the water. It was a little rough and choppy, but quite warm. They floated like logs of wood spread out flat on the water. Then once more they swam on. But it began to seem as if Tom would not reach the shore of the third island. His arms felt so tired, his legs seemed to have no push in them. He gasped and panted, and Andy began to feel alarmed. Tread water a bit, he called to Tom. Do you think you'll be able to swim the rest of the way? I, I don't know, said poor Tom, dreadfully ashamed of himself. But he could not seem to make his arms work properly. He was really tired out. Andy trod water beside Tom, wondering what to do. Try again, Tom. It's no use going back. We're more than halfway across. Tom looked at the cliff on the third island. It seemed a long, long way away still. He tried again, striking out bravely with his tired arms, but after about six strokes he could not swim any more. He turned on his back and floated again. Andy was really alarmed. Tom, you can't do any more, he said. I'll have to help you. I'll swim on my back and you must lie on your front and put your arms on my shoulders. I can drag you along in the water that way, but it'll be rather slow. Thanks, Andy, said Tom, very angry with his poor swimming, but quite unable to do anything else. He took hold of Andy's shoulders, and Andy, lying on his back with his head towards the third island, began to strike out valiantly with his brown legs. It was very slow indeed, and now Andy began to get tired. It wasn't long before neither of them had any strength left, and goodness knows what would have happened if Andy, striking out desperately with his legs, had not felt something hard beneath him. He felt about with his feet, and at last discovered a rock below the water. They'd come to a kind of rocky reef, rather like the one they climbed over from their own island to the second one. T Tom, Tom, put your feet down and feel where the rocks are, gasped Andy. We can stand there and maybe feel our way along a bit till we come to the sandy bottom. Tom soon found foothold on the rocks under the water. He felt better at once. He and Andy held hands and together made their way very cautiously over the sunken rocks, bruising their feet but getting gradually nearer to the shore. And at last they felt the rocks stop and there was sand beneath their feet. Good. Oh, golly, I didn't enjoy that very much, said Tom. Sorry I was so feeble, Andy. Hey, it's all right. You did your best. We're all right now. But in his own mind, Andy didn't think they were all right. How in the world was he going to get Tom over that stretch of water back to the second island again? He would never, never do it. Andy was very worried indeed. They lay on the sandy shore in the sun for a while, drying themselves. Tom felt very much better after a meal out of the oilskin packet. He almost felt as if he could swim back home again. I feel a new man now, he said, leaping to his feet. Come on, Andy, let's go up the cliff top and go across to the other side of this island to see if we can spy anything. Andy got up too. The two boys climbed up the rough cliff and sat on the top to get back their breath. The island seemed to be about the same as the other two, covered with heather, bracken and grass, and with white gulls soaring over it. They crossed the narrow width of the island and at last came to the cliff on the other side. Wriggle along on the ground now, just in case there's anyone about, said Andy. So both boys wriggled along on their fronts and came at last to a place where they could see down to the water far below. 
and what they saw there filled them with such astonishment and alarm that for at least five minutes neither boy could say a word. The sight that the two boys looked down upon was hardly to be believed. There was a very fine natural harbour of extremely deep water on the northeastern side of the third island, and lying in this water were at least seven or eight submarines. Submarines? A submarine base in these deserted islands? No wonder so many of our ships have been sent to the bottom in the waters of these islands. It's a real nest of submarines, whispered Andy at last. Enemy submarines? I can't believe it. The boys lay looking down on the water. Some of the submarines lay like great grey crocodiles humped out of the water, one or two of them moving out of the harbour, their periscopes showing. They get fuel and food here, whispered Andy. There are the small submarines. This harbour can easily take a dozen or more. It's a perfect place for submarines. Do you see how they haven't built any jetties or piers? Not a thing that anyone could see. If one of our planes came over, all they'd have to do then would be to sink under the water. And then there'd be nothing to see. They store everything in the caves. Golly, it's amazing. For a very long time, the two boys lay watching the strange sight below. Two submarines slipped silently out of the harbour entrance, away between two reefs of high rocks. A third submarine came in and lay peacefully with the other, the men coming out on the deck and looking around. At first, Tom had been so full of surprise and alarm that he could think of nothing but the sight of the queer vessels. Then another thought came into his head, and he turned to Andy. Andy, he said, we've got to get home and tell what we've seen. I know. I'm thinking that too, Tom. And we've got to get the girls off these islands. We're all in danger. If the enemy know we're spying on them like this, I don't know what would happen to us. I don't care how much danger we're in, said Tom. All I know is that we've got to go and tell our people at home about this submarine base. It's got to be cleared away, Andy. It's serious. But do you think we should be believed if we go home with a story like this? We'll get your camera and take a few photographs, said Andy. Nobody can disbelieve photographs. And another thing we must do is to try to do something with our boat. We must get it off the rocks somehow and try to patch it up. It's our only way of getting back home. They watched the harbour for a little while longer, and then wriggled along the top of the cliff till they came to some bushes. They went down by these and ran along till they came to the end of the harbour. Beyond lay a cover, and in it, drawn up to the sand, were a number of small boats. No one seemed to be about. The sight of the little boats excited Andy. If only he could get hold of one, then he and Tom could row round the island and get back to the second one safely. Andy knew perfectly well that Tom could not swim back, and he did not mean to leave the boy alone on this submarine island. Tom, see those boats? Well, what about waiting till night time and then stealing down to the cove and taking a boat? We could easily row it back to the second island. It would save us having to swim, and we might even fill it with food and water and try our luck at going home. I could fix up a sail somehow. Good idea, Andy, said Tom. But I say, won't the girls be awfully worried if we don't swim back before low tide tonight? We'll go over to the cliff on the other side of this island and wave to them. They've got the field glasses and we'll see quite clearly. We'll point and wave and nod and try to show that our plans have altered, but we're all right. Good, said Tom. Let's go now. The boys went to the other side of the island. After a while, the girls appeared and waved to them. Jill put the glasses to her eyes. The boys seemed frightfully pleased and excited about something, she said. They're waving and pointing and nodding like anything. They seem to want us to understand something. Well, it can only be that they've found something exciting and are going to do something about it, said Mary, taking the glasses from Jill and looking through them. Yes, Tom's like a mad thing. Well, we'll know when they come back tonight. I only hope Tom will be able to swim back all right. I was really afraid he'd drown this morning. The boys disappeared after a time. They sat down in a little sunny hollow and finished the rest of the food. Andy found a stream of water and the boys drank from it. Then they sat talking quietly, waiting for the night to come. At last it came. The moon was behind the clouds and gave only a pale light now and again. The boys slipped quietly to the top of the cliff that overlooked the small cove next to the harbour. They had already planned the easiest way down. Andy went first. He climbed like a cat. Tom followed him, trying not to send any stones clattering down the cliff. They came to the shore. It was sandy and their feet made no noise. The boys stayed in the shadow of the cliffs for a few minutes, listening. 
They could hear no noise at all except the small sound of little waves breaking on the sand. The boats were not far off, upturned in a row. No one was guarding them. The boys crept over the silvery sand. Take the boat on the left, whispered Andy. It's just our size. They came to the boat, and then they heard voices. They seemed to come from the far side of the cliff and sounded clearly in the night. The boys could not hear any words, but the sound was enough to make them lie down flat beside the boat they'd chosen. Tom was trembling. Suppose they were found out just as they were taking the boat. It would be too bad. The boys listened until the sound of voices died away, and then they cautiously lifted their heads. When the moon gets into that very thick cloud, we'll turn the boat over and run her into the water. You take this side and I'll take the other. Be ready. Right, whispered back Tom. So when the moon slipped behind the dark clouds, the boys rose silently to their feet. They turned over the boat with hardly a sound, though it was awkward and heavy. Then they pulled it over the sand to the water. Tom got in and took the oars. Andy pushed the boat right out and leapt in himself. The moon was still hidden. Silently the boys rowed away from the shore, hoping that the moon would remain behind the cloud until they'd pulled out of sight. No shout was heard, no running feet. They were undiscovered, so far. They rowed fast. When the moon came out again, they were far from the little cove. Look, pull round a bit more. We're passing round the edge of the island. We've done well to get here so quickly. Soon they were right round the narrow end of the third island. They rowed into the broad stretch of water between the second and third islands, then across to the shore below the cliff where they left the girls. Jill and Mary were watching there. They'd been very worried when night had come and brought with it no boys. They couldn't imagine what had happened. And then Jill, looking through the glasses, when the moon had swum out into a clear piece of sky, had seen a little boat coming into the stretch of water between the two islands. She clutched Mary's arm. Look, a boat! Is it the enemy? The girls looked and looked, their hearts beating loudly. They could not see who was in the boat. It landed on the beach, and then the call of a seagull floated up the cliff. Andy, cried Jill, nearly falling down the cliff. It's Andy. I'd know his seagull call anywhere. The boys climbed up the cliff and came to the rocky ledge. The girls fell on them and hugged them like bears. The boat! Where did you get the boat? cried Jill. What did you see? What did you find? cried Mary. We'll tell you all about it, said Andy, and the four of them sat close together on the cold, windy ledge, quite forgetful of the chilly breeze, talking and listening eagerly. The girls could hardly believe the boy's story. It seemed quite impossible. And now that we've got a boat, we'll fill it full of food and water and see if we can get home. It's the only thing we can do, and we must do it. But Andy, said Jill, just suppose the enemy see their boat is missing. Won't they take alarm and search the islands? Yes, they certainly will. And so we must start tomorrow. We'll have a good sleep tonight, take plenty of food from the cave and see if we can make for home. If only we can get away before the enemy finds that the boat is missing, said Tom. Oh, do you suppose we will? The children did not have a very good night after all, for they were far too excited to sleep. They'd all rowed in the stolen boat to their own island and had landed there, tied up the boat and gone to their shack. They slept rather late the next morning, for not one of them had gone to sleep before midnight, and they were awakened by the throbbing noise that they'd heard two nights before. Oh, the seaplane again, said Andy, waking up at once and leaping to his feet. He ran to the open doorway of the hut and was just in time to see the plane soar overhead. Then it went round in great circles, ready to land on the smooth water outside the second island. That means we can't get away today, said Tom at once. We simply must get food into the boat. And we can't if that plane is there. No, we can't, said Andy. But I tell you what we might do. We might row to the third island, tie up our boat in a hidden place, creep to the top of that cliff and try to take a few photographs of the submarine bay. Yes, we could do that, said Tom. We'll have to be pretty careful, though. We will be, said Andy. Jill, what's there for breakfast? There were tin sausages and baked beans and tomato sauce. Jill proudly produced some little rolls of bread that she'd made, too. They all ate in silence, thinking over everything that had happened. That seaplane may not stay long, said Andy. It didn't last time. I expect it's come to add to the stores or maybe take away from them. It'll be busy that side of the island, so we'll row round the other side so we won't be seen. Go across to the third one and tie up there. You girls must stay here. Oh, you always have the exciting things to do, sighed Mary. Can't we really come with you? I don't see why we can't. Well, if you promise to do exactly what you're told, you can come said Andy, after a minute's thought. The girls were thrilled. 
They cleared away the breakfast things and washed up. They prepared a meal to take with them. It was a very good thing that they discovered that store cave. They now had plenty of food of all kinds. They did hope the seaplane wouldn't take everything away. They all got into the boat and the boys rowed off and were careful to keep to the side opposite the cave when they came to the second island. They rowed quickly over to the space of water separating that island from the third and came to the farthest tip of it. Here there was a tiny beach with steep overhanging cliffs, so overhanging that it almost seemed as if a big piece was about to fall off. Just the place, said Andy, pulling into the tiny beach. Jump out, girls. Take the food with you. Give a hand with a boat, Tom. We'll run it up to the beach and put it right under that dangerous piece of cliff. It'll be well hidden there. They put the boat there and looked at it. The end of it jutted out and could be seen. Jill ran to a seaweed-covered rock and pulled off handfuls of the weed. Let's make the boat into a rock, she said with a laugh. Cover it with seaweed. A jolly good idea, said Andy. I don't know how girls could have such ideas. You wait and see what fine ideas we have, said Mary. They all pulled at the seaweed, and soon the boat was nicely draped and looked so exactly like a seaweed-covered rock that no one could possibly guess it wasn't, even if they'd passed quite near to it. That's good. Now, we'll make our way very carefully across this end of the island till we come to a little cove where we took our boat from. We'll just peep over the cliff and see if there's anyone there looking as if they've missed the boat. Then we'll crawl to the top of the next cliff that overlooks the submarine bay. And Tom, we'll have to take a few pictures. Everything went well. Keeping close to tall bushes of gorse and bramble, the four children crept over the tip of the island and soon came to the cliff below which was the boat cave. Cautiously, Andy parted some bramble sprays and peeped down to the beach below. There were the rest of the little boats, still upturned. Nobody was about at all. As far as Andy could see, the stolen boat had not been missed. Good. Going very slowly and cautiously indeed, the four of them made their way under bushes and bracken to the top of the next cliff. They all lay on their tummies and peeped between the tall bracken. The girls drew a long breath of surprise. Golly, said Jill. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. However many submarines are there? and all of them marked with the swastika. An enemy submarine base so near to our land, said Mary, and nobody knows it. Where's your camera, Tom? whispered Andy. Tom had it round his shoulder, carefully took it out of its waterproof case and set it for taking distant pictures. It's got the seaplane on the first two negatives, said the boy in a low tone. I'll fill up the rest of the film with photos of the submarines. The pictures can easily be made larger when we get home. Then nobody can disbelieve us or say we made it all up. Click went the camera. One picture taken, said Tom. I got in those two big submarines together, just over there. Click, 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 click. Soon the whole film was used. I'll wait till I get back to the hut and then I'll wind off the film in a dark corner, said the boy. That's a spot of good work done. He put the camera back into its case and strapped it up. The four children lay and looked at the nest of submarines in the water below. Another came slipping in as they watched. Two slipped out. I gone to sink some more of our ships, I suppose, said Andy angrily. If only I could stop them. But we'll clean up the whole lot once we get the news back home. I guess we'll have a battleship or two sent out here. Where will it be safe to have something to eat? asked Tom. I do feel hungry. I wish I'd had a shilling for every time I've heard Tom say that, said Jill with a giggle. Well, I only say what the rest of you are thinking, said Tom. I bet you're all hungry. They were. Andy found a little bracken dell not far from the top of the cliff. Here the bracken was taller than the children, and once they'd settled themselves down, nobody could possibly see them, either from above or passing by. They ate a good meal and enjoyed it. They lay on their backs and looked between the fronds at the blue sky. It was marvellous and the weather was still so good. Now, we'd better get back, said Andy. Oh, why? asked Jill lazily. I was almost asleep. I'll tell you why, said Andy. Supposing that stolen boat is missed, well, the first place search would be this island, and we'd be found. No, the best thing for us to do is to go straight back now, wait till the seaplane has left, and then go straight to the store cave and fill our boat with food. Then we'll start off tonight. All right, we'll come along now then, said Jill, getting up. They made their way very cautiously back to the tiny beach where they'd hidden their boat. It was still there beautifully draped with seaweed. Nobody had discovered it. The children dragged it down to the waves and jumped in. Andy pushed it out. 
They took turns at rowing. They were halfway round the second island on the coast opposite to the one where the store cave was when a dreadful thing happened. The seaplane chose that minute to leave the water by the second island and to rise into the air ready to fly off. The children had no time to rush their boat into shore and hide. They were out on the sea, clearly to be seen. Crouched down flat on the boat, so that the pilot may perhaps think there's nobody in it, ordered Andy. They shipped the oars quickly and crouched down. The seaplane rose up high and the children hardly dared to breathe. They did so hope it would fly off without noticing them. But it suddenly altered its course and began to circle round, coming down lower. It flew down low enough to examine the boat and then, rising high, flew over the third island and then flew down to the submarine bay. Andy sat up, his face rather pale under its brown. That's done it, he said. They saw us. Now they'll count their boats. They'll find one's missing and they'll come looking for us. The children looked at one another in the greatest dismay. Nobody could think what to do. Andy longed desperately for some grown-up who could take command and tell him what the best thing would be to do. But there was no grown-up. This was something he had to decide for himself, and he must decide well, because the two girls were in his care. We'd better row straight round to the store cave and fill the boat with food whilst we can, he said at last. Then we'll start out straight away and hope that the seaplane won't spot us out on the sea. It's the only thing to do. It was a long row round to the cave, but they got there at last, quite tired out. There was no one about. They beached the boat and jumped out. It was not long before they were in the round cave, carrying out stacks of tins and boxes to the boat. Golly, we've enough food to last for weeks, said Tom. We may need it, said Andy. Goodness knows how far it is back home. I've not much the slightest idea of which direction to take, but I'll do my best. Tom staggered to the boat with heaps of things. Andy looked at the pile of food at the end of the boat and nodded his head. Aye, that's enough, he said. We don't want to make the boat too heavy to row. Get in. They all got in. They rowed out beyond the reef of rocks where they'd found a way in and then towards their own island. Andy wanted to get the rugs for he was sure they would be bitterly cold at night. You girls jump out and go and fetch all the warm things you can find, said Andy. And bring a cup or two and a knife. I've got the tin opener. The girls sped off to the shack in the hollow, and whilst they were gone, the boys heard the sound they dreaded to hear. The noise of the seaplane engines booming over the water. There it comes again, said Andy angrily. Always at the wrong moment. Lie down flat, Tom. I hope the girls will have the sense to do the same. The seaplane zoomed low over the island as if it was hunting for someone. Then it droned over the sea and flew round in great circles. Andy lifted his head and watched it. Ah, oh, you know what it's doing, he said. It's flying round, hunting the sea for our boat. It's a good thing we didn't set out straight away. I think we'd better wait for night to come, and then we'd better set out in the darkness. They waited till the drone of the plane's engines was far away. It was hunting the waters everywhere for the stolen boat. Andy stood up and yelled to the girls who were lying flat under a bush. It's gone for the moment. Help us to take out these goods and hide them. If the boat is discovered here and taken away and we're made prisoners on this island, we shall be at least sure of stores. If we're able to start out tonight, we can easily put back the food, said Tom. They all worked hard and buried the tins and boxes under some loose sand at the top of the beach. They pulled the boat further up the beach and then sat down to rest, hot and tired. And then poor Tom gave a squeal of dismay. The others jumped and looked at him in fright. Whatever's the matter? asked Dandy. My camera, said Tom, his face a picture of horror. My camera with all those pictures I took. I left it in the store cave. Left it in the store cave, said everyone. Whatever for? Well, I was afraid I'd bump it against those rocks, carrying it up and down those passages, said Tom. So I took it off for a minute, meaning to put it on when we, when we went, and I forgot. You fathead, said Jill. Don't call me that, said poor Tom, looking almost ready to cry. He blinked his eyes and swallowed a lump that had suddenly come into his throat. He knew how valuable the pictures were that he'd taken. Cheer up, Tom. I know what you feel like. I felt just like that when I found I'd forgotten to bring the anchor in the ship. It's awful. Tom was grateful to Andy for not scolding him, but all the same he felt really dreadful. They had gone to such a lot of trouble to get those photographs, 
and now, all because of his carelessness, they've been left behind. I vote we have something to eat, said Andy, thinking that that would cheer Tom up. But it didn't. For once, in a way, Tom had no appetite at all. He sat nearby, looking gloomily at the others. The seaplane did not come back. The children sat and waited for the evening to come, when they might start. Jill yawned. Oh, I must do something for the next two or three hours, she said, or I shall fall asleep. I think I'll take the kettle and keep filling it with water at the spring and bring it back to the boat. There's a big water barrel there, and we could fill it with water. Good idea. You and Mary do that. I think I'll just wander up to the bush where we put the sail and see if it's still there. I don't think I've time to rig up some kind of a mast in this little boat so the sail won't be any good, but it might be useful to cover us if it should happen to pour with rain. The girls went off. Andy nodded to Tom, who was still looking gloomy, and went across the island to the bush where he put the sail. Tom was left alone. They don't want me with them, thought the boy quite wrongly. They think I'm awful. I think I'm awful too. Oh dear, if only I could get my camera. He thought of the reef of rocks that led to the second island. It wasn't a bit of use trying to climb over them because the tide was getting high now. But then he thought of the boat. It really wasn't a great distance to row to the cave from the beach where he was. And how pleased the others would be if he got back his camera. He dragged the boat down the beach by himself though he nearly pulled his arms out doing it. He pushed it into the water and jumped in. He took the oars and began to row quickly round to the second island. He would land on the shore, then run quickly to the cave and get his camera. Then I'll be back here with it almost before the others know I'm gone, he thought. Nobody would have known what Tom had done if Andy had not happened to look around as he went over the little island to find the sail. To his enormous astonishment, he saw their boat being rowed away. He could not see that the one in it was Tom, and for a moment he stood still, wondering what had happened. Was it another boat, not their own? He ran quickly to find out. He soon saw that it was their own boat. He saw where Tom had dragged it down the beach. He could just see the boat rounding the corner of the cliff now. That was Tom, all right, said Andy to himself. The girls came back at that moment and shouted to Andy. What's the matter? Where's the boat? Tom's gone off with it, said Andy angrily. Tom? Whatever do you mean, Andy? asked Jill in the greatest surprise. I suppose he felt upset about leaving his camera behind, and he's gone to get it by himself. He really is a fathead. It may be seen and caught. I'm quite sure someone will be hunting for us soon. Really, I could shake Tom till his teeth rattled. The girls stared at Andy in dismay. They did not like at all the idea of their brother going off alone in the boat. Well, they would just have to wait patiently till Tom came back. Jill set the kettle of water down on the beach. She felt tired. Mary sat down beside her and looked out over the water for Tom to come back. Andy walked up and down impatiently. He could understand that Tom longed to get back his camera and put himself right with the others so that they no longer thought him careless and silly, but he did wish he hadn't gone off in their precious boat. The three children waited and waited. The sun sank lower. It disappeared over the skyline and the first stars glimmered in the darkening sky. And still Tom was not back. The girls could no longer see anything on the sea which was now dark. They could only sit and listen for the splash of oars. I should think he's been caught, said Andy at last. There can't be another reason why he's not back. Now we're in a pretty fix. No Tom and no boat. What had happened to Tom? A great many things. He rode safely to the beach where the caves lay hidden in the cliff behind. He dragged the boat up the sand and gone into the first cave. He stumbled through the rocky archway and into the queer round cave which was so full of food. He had no torch, so he had to feel around in the dark for his camera, and it took him a long time to find it. Where did I put it? wondered the boy anxiously. Oh, if only I had a match. But at last his hand fell on the box-like shape of his camera, safe in its waterproof covering. Good, Tom thought. Now I'll just rush down to the boat and row back. I really must be quick or the others will be worried. But Tom had a dreadful shock as he was about to make his way out of the round cave back to the beach. 
he heard voices. The boy stood perfectly still, his heart beating fast. Whose voices were these? They came nearer. Men were on the beach outside. Men had found his boat. Was it the enemy? Alas for poor Tom, it was the enemy. Tom had not heard the boom of the seaplane coming down on the water. He'd not seen a rubber boat putting off hurriedly to the cave. But now he could hear the voices of the men. They'd seen the boat on the beach and had come to examine it. They soon saw that it was the stolen boat, which had now been missed and which was being searched for. The men knew at once where the owner of the boat was, in the cave, and they were going to search for him there. Tom darted back into the round cave and hid behind a big pile of boxes. He felt quite certain he would be found as he crouched there, trembling and excited. He made up his mind, very, very firmly, that he would not say how many others had come to the islands with him. He would make the men think that he was the only one, then maybe the other three would not be hunted for. The men came into the round cave. They had powerful torches which they flashed around and almost at once they saw Tom's feet sticking out from behind a box. They dragged him out and stood him up. They seemed most astonished to find only a boy. They had expected a man. They talked quickly amongst themselves in a language that Tom could not understand. The one man who could talk English spoke to Tom. How did you get to this island? I set off in a sailing boat and a storm blew up and wrecked me, said Tom. Is there anyone else with you on this island? asked the man. Speak the truth. Tom could reply quite truthfully that there was no one else with him on the island. Thank goodness the others were on the first island. There isn't anyone else here with me, he answered. Search the cave and see. The men did search the cave again, but found nobody, of course. How did you find this cave? asked the man who spoke English. By accident, said Tom. And I suppose you also found our boat by accident, and saw the submarines by accident said the man, in a very nasty voice. Are you sure there is no one else here with you? Quite sure, said Tom. We shall not take your word for it, said the man. We shall search this island and both those next to it. If we find anyone else, you will be very, very sorry for yourself. You won't find anyone, said Tom, wishing he could warn Andy and the girls somehow. Are you going to keep me a prisoner? We certainly are said the man, and as you seem so fond of this cave, we'll let you stay here. You have food to eat, and you won't be able to do any spying around if you're in this cave. We shall put a man on guard at the entrance, so if you try to get out, or anyone else tries to get in, you will be caught. Our man will be well hidden behind a rock at the entrance, and if any friends of yours try to rescue you, they will get a shock. Tom listened, his heart sinking into his shoes. Oh, what an idiot he'd been. He sat down on a box. He wouldn't cry. He would not show the men how frightened and worried he was. His face was brave and bold, but inside he felt as if he was crying buckets of tears. If only, only he could get word to Andy. There was nothing he could do, nothing. He could only sit there in the cave surrounded by marvellous food that he felt too worried even to look at and think about the others. The men left a lamp in the cave for Tom. It was getting late and the boy was tired, but he couldn't sleep. He heard the men go out and he knew a sentry had been placed by the rocks. He could not hope to escape, but he could try. So very quietly he made his way through the rocky archway, down to the shore cave below but his feet set the stones moving here and there and a voice came out of the darkness. He couldn't understand what was said to him but the voice was so stern that the boy fled back to the round cave at once. It wasn't a bit of good trying to escape. He sat down again and wondered about the others. Would they come to look for him when the tide uncovered the rocks next day? If so, they would certainly be caught. Andy and the girls sat up until they could keep awake no longer. They went back to the shack curled up on their beds and slept restlessly worrying about Tom and the lost boat. In the morning, Andy went out cautiously, wondering if the enemy had already landed a boat on their island to hunt for them, but he could see nothing strange. He sat talking to the girls as they prepared breakfast. Tom is certainly caught, 
he said. There's no doubt about that, I'm afraid. Well, I know enough of Tom to know that he won't say we are here too. He won't give us away. But they will certainly come and hunt for anyone else who might be here. We have to do two things. Hide ourselves so that we can't possibly be found and then think of some way of rescuing Tom. Oh dear, it seems quite impossible, said Jill, feeling very worried. Mary began to cry. Don't cry, Mary, said Andy, putting his arms round her. We have to be brave now. But Andy, how can we hide on this bare island? said Mary, drying her eyes and blinking away her tears. There are no good trees to hide in, not a single cave. Really, there isn't anywhere at all. Oh, you're right, Mary, said Andy. It's going to be very difficult, but we must think of something. Yes, it's very, very important, said Jill thoughtfully. Let's think of ways of hiding. The bracken is no use at all, is it? Mm, not a bit of use, said Andy. I think we might perhaps wade out to the ship and hide in the cabin, but I know they'd look there. Could we hide in the shack? asked Mary. Pile the heather over ourselves or something? No, said Andy. The shack's no use. We should be discovered there at once. It's a good thing we've got plenty of food hidden in the sand, said Jill. If we can manage to hide ourselves away, we need not starve. We've only got to go and dig up that store of food. Yes, that's very lucky. I say, listen, that's the sound of a motorboat, isn't it? Andy crept out to sea, keeping well under cover. Yes, there was a motorboat coming around the corner of the island, a motorboat with five men in it. They're coming, whispered Andy. They're in a motorboat. Quick, where should we hide? We'd better rush over to the opposite side of the island, said Jill, her face pale. The first place they'll hunt is this side, where they land. Quick, Mary. The three children slipped out of the shack and made their way up the rocky path. They were just out of sight when the motorboat landed on the beach. They would be able to reach the other side of the island unseen. But what could they do there? The shore there was nothing but rocks and sand. They'd be found in two minutes. Andy and the girls did not take long to reach the opposite shore of the island. They slid down the steep cliff there and reached the beach. It was sandy but at one side was a mass of seaweed-covered rocks. It was impossible to hide behind them, for a moment's search would at once discover them. They looked at one another in despair. Any good wading out into the sea and keeping underwater? asked Jill. No, we'd have to keep popping our heads up to breathe and we'd be seen at once. Jill stared at the rocks nearby and then she gave such a squeal that Andy and Mary jumped in fright. Shh! said Andy angrily. You'll be heard. Whatever's the matter? I've thought of how to hide, said Jill breathlessly. It's the same idea I had for hiding that boat. Can't we cover ourselves with sand and then drape ourselves with seaweed to look like rocks? We could go and lie down beside those rocks, and if we were well covered with weeds, we'd look exactly like them. Golly, that is an idea, said Andy at once. Quick, I'll cover you girls with sand at once. Come over here. The three ran to the rocks. The tide was out, and the sand was hard but damp. Andy made the girls lie down together and then piled sand high over them, leaving a space for their noses for breathing. Then he dragged great handfuls of seaweed from the rocks and threw it over the sandy mound. When he had finished, the girls looked exactly like the seaweed-covered rocks nearby. Andy covered with loose seaweed the untidy places he'd made in the sand. Then he began to make a hole for himself and to cover himself too. He draped himself with piles of seaweed and then poked up his head to look at the girls. He really didn't know which of the rocks they were. He simply couldn't tell. Jill, Mary, he called in a low voice. As soon as you hear me screaming like a gull, you must lie absolutely still. You look marvellous. I didn't know which rock you were until one of you moved. Andy, I'm afraid one of the men might tread on me, said Mary in a frightened voice. Well, let him, said Andy. They all lay quietly for a time and then Andy heard voices coming near. He cried like a seagull, and the girls then lay so still that not even the tiniest bit of seaweed above them moved at all. The men slid down to the sandy shore, calling to one another in loud voices. Andy couldn't understand anything they said. All the children's hearts beat loudly, and Jill wondered if hers could possibly be heard. It seemed to her to be thumping as loudly as a hammer. The men stood on the beach, 
and looked round. One man shouted something to the others and began to walk over to the rocks. Andy felt most alarmed. I do hope we look like real rocks, he thought. The man came nearer. He stood near Andy and took out a packet of cigarettes. Andy heard him strike a match and knew that he'd lit a cigarette. The man threw the empty cigarette packet onto the sand and puffed at his cigarette. A young gull, seeing the man throw the packet away, thought that it might be a piece of bread. It flew down to sea, crying, Ew! Ew! very loudly. The other gulls heard it and soared round in circles, wondering if there was any food to find. Some of them flew down, and two stood on Andy, and one stood on the girls. The children looked so exactly like rocks that the gulls really thought they were. One gull thought the rock felt unusually soft and warm, and he bent his head down and pecked at it. He pecked Andy's knee, and the boy nearly gave a yell. The men joined the one who was smoking a cigarette. One man said that it was plain there could be nobody hiding, for the gulls would not stand about as they were doing if there was anyone hiding. They would know it and be suspicious. For some time, the men stood talking and smoking. Then they turned to go up the cliff again. One walked so near Andy that the boy could feel the thud of his footfall close by. Up the cliff climbed the men and disappeared over the top. Andy cautiously lifted his head after a while and looked around. There was no one to be seen. Mary, Jill, he called in a low voice. I think the men are gone, but we must still be careful. Slowly and carefully take off the weed and shake yourselves free of the sand. Be ready to lie still at once if I say so. But there was no need to say so. The men did not come back to the beach. The three children shook off the damp sand, threw the seaweed over the places where they'd been lying and ran quickly to the shelter of the cliff where no one could see them if they looked over. The gulls flew off in the greatest surprise and alarm. They could not understand rocks turning into children so suddenly. Golly, said Andy, as they stood shivering under the cliff. That was a narrow escape. One man very nearly trod on my hand under the sand. What have you done to your knee, Andy? asked Jill, pointing to where Andy's knee was bleeding. A gull pecked me there, said Andy, mopping his knee. It's nothing much. I say, wasn't it funny when the gulls thought we were rocks and came and stood on us? They were a great help. One gull nearly stood on my face, said Jill. I didn't like that very much. Oh, I do feel cold, said Mary, shivering and shaking. It was horrid to be covered with damp sand for so long. She sneezed. Andy looked at her anxiously. It would never do for any of them to be ill just now. He made up his mind quickly. The men may be off to the island now. I'll go and see. If they are, we'll tear across to the hut, light the stove inside and dry ourselves. We'll make some hot cocoa and get really warm. The girls thought that was a splendid idea. Andy set off up the cliff. Stay here until you hear my seagull cry. Then come as quickly as you can. He came to the top of the cliff. Then, keeping to the thick bracken, he made his way to the other side of the island, looking out for any signs of the men. He went right across the island and came to the hollow where the old buildings were, and he saw the motorboat putting off from the shore. The men had given up the hunt and were going back to the third island. They'd already searched the second one and found no one but Tom. Andy tore back to the girls. He screeched like a gull. The girls at once climbed the cliff and ran across the island, feeling a little warmer as they ran. Andy was in the shack and the stove was lit. It gave out a welcome heat. Take off your damp things and wrap yourselves in the rugs. I'm making some cocoa. In ten minutes' time, all the children felt warm and lively. The stove dried their things, and the hot cocoa warmed them well. Nobody sneezed again, and Andy began to hope that their long stay under the damp sand wouldn't give anyone a chill after all. Andy, what are you going to do now? asked Jill, sipping her cocoa. We've got plenty of food, luckily, because we buried it all in the sand at the top of the beach out there. But we can't get away, because our boat's gone and we've lost Tom. Have we got to stay here for the rest of our lives? Oh, don't be so silly, Jill, said Andy. Let's tackle one thing at a time, for goodness sake. We've done the most important thing so far, hidden ourselves so well that we weren't found. And now we'll do the next most important thing. We'll rescue Tom. After that, we'll think how to escape. I would like to rescue poor Tom, said Jill. He will be so lonely and upset. Where do you suppose he is? In the cave where he left his camera, I expect, 
said Andy, pouring himself out another cup of cocoa. And I'm pretty certain there'll be a guard somewhere at the entrance. For if there were not, Tom would soon escape, so we won't run into trouble. We'll see if there isn't some other way of rescuing Tom. How can there be? asked Jill. I don't know yet, but I do know this. We thought it was impossible to hide safely on this bare little island, yet we did it. And so, though it sounds impossible to rescue Tom, there may be a way if we think hard enough. So now, let's all think hard. Nobody could think how to rescue Tom. After all, if there was someone guarding the cave entrance, how could Andy possibly get in without being seen? The boy gave it up after a time, and for a change, he set the gramophone going. There was only one record that wasn't broken, and that was the one with the lullaby on one side and the nursery rhymes on the other. The girls listened, rather bored, for they'd heard that record scores of times since they'd come to the island. Turn it off, Andy, said Jill. If I hear that voice crooning that lullaby any more, I shall go to sleep. Andy switched off the gramophone and went to the doorway of the shack. He was not afraid of the men coming back again, for he was sure they thought there was no one on this island at any rate. A thought came into Andy's head. He went back to the girls. I think it would be a good thing if I crossed to the second island tonight, when it's dark, he said. I might be able to get in touch with Tom somehow and hear what's happened, even if I can't rescue him. Oh, Andy, we should be left all alone, said Mary in dismay. We don't mind that if Andy can help Tom, said Jill. So that night, when he had only the starlight to guide him, for the moon was not up, Andy crossed the line of rocks to the second island. He went very cautiously, for he did not want a single sound to come to the ears of anyone on the cave beach. He waded through the shallow water to the sand at the nearer end of the beach, and stood there, listening. Not very far off, close against the cliff where the cave entrance was, he heard a cough. Oh, said Andy to himself, thanks for that cough, dear sentry. I now know exactly where you are. You're behind that big rock at the cave opening. Well, I shall not go near you. The boy stood quite still for a while, listening. The sentry most obligingly cleared his throat and coughed again very loudly. Andy grinned. He made his way carefully round to the end of the cliff and then began to climb up, feeling his way cautiously. The cliff there was not very steep and Andy was soon at the top. He found a little hollow where heather and gorse grew thickly. He crept under an overhanging piece of bush, piled the heather beneath him, and slept peacefully. He knew he could do nothing till morning came, and he could see where he was. The sun rose, and Andy awoke. He was stiff, and he stretched himself and yawned. He wriggled carefully to the edge of the cliff and looked over. Almost below him was the sentry he had heard last night, behind a rock at the cave entrance. As Andy looked down, he saw a boat coming to the shore, and a man stepped off and walked up the beach to change places with the sentry. They stood talking for a while, and then the first sentry went back to the boat, yawning, and the new one settled down to his task of waiting and watching. Andy sat and thought. He wriggled back to a place where he imagined he must be exactly over the round cave. He wondered if Tom could hear him, if he drummed on the ground with his feet. And then a most extraordinary thing happened, so startling that Andy's heart jumped almost out of his body. A groan came from somewhere under his legs. Andy was lying on the heather, and when the groan came, he shot his legs up beneath him and stared at the place where the groan had come from, as if he simply couldn't believe his eyes or ears. A smaller groan sounded, more like a long yawn. Andy stared at the heather and wondered if his ears could be right. Heather couldn't yawn or groan. Then what was it? Very cautiously and gently, the boy turned himself about and began to feel in the heather. He pulled it to one side, and to his enormous astonishment, he found a hole below the roots of the heather, a hole that must lead down to the round cave, for Andy reckoned that he must be exactly over that cave. No wonder that cave didn't smell as musty and stuffy as we expected it to, he thought. There's an air hole leading right down to it. He pulled up the heather and examined the hole. The earth was dry and sandy. Andy scraped away hard and found that it was quite easy to make it bigger. 
Just suppose he could make it big enough to get down, or for Tom to get up. He crawled to the top of the cliff and looked over it. The sentry was still there, and he was busy eating his breakfast. You know, he was all right for some time. Andy crawled back to the hole. He scraped about a little more and then lay down with his face in the hole. It seemed to go down and down into the darkness. Andy spoke in a low voice. Tom, are you there? And was Tom there? Yes, he was. He'd been in the round cave alone and lonely ever since he'd been caught. It had seemed ages to him. The boy had worried dreadfully about the others. He'd eaten a little of the food around him, but he'd no appetite now. He was miserable and frightened. They would not show this to any of the sentries who occasionally came up the rocky passageway to see if he was all right. The man who could speak English had come to see him the evening before. We have searched the first island and this one, he had told Tom. We have found your shack, and we have found your friends too. Tom's heart sank when he heard this, but he said nothing. I tell you, we have found your friends, said the man. They fought hard, but they have been captured. Tom stared at the man in surprise. He knew quite well that the girls would not fight men. Then he suddenly knew that the man was hoping to trap him into saying something about the others. He didn't even know for certain that there were any others. Well, two can play at that game and pretend like that, thought the boy. So he put on a face of great surprise and said, "Golly, are there others on these islands? Then I wish I'd known. I could have asked them for help." The man looked surprised. So perhaps this boy had no friends then. Could it be that he was really alone? The man didn't know what to think. He said no more, but turned and went out of the cave. It was very lonely in the round cave. Tom slept heavily all the night through, but found the day very, very dull. He sat on a box and groaned deeply. Then he yawned loudly. He was bored. He was lonely. He sat there, doing nothing. And then he heard a very peculiar noise above his head, a kind of scraping noise. Tom wondered what it could be. Perhaps it's a rabbit or something. He thought, but no, it couldn't be. The roof of the cave is of rock. The scraping noise went on, and then something happened that made Tom leap up in fright. A strange, hollow voice came into the cave from somewhere. It ran all round the cave, and Tom could just make out the words. Tom, are you there? It was really Andy's voice, of course, coming down the hole to the cave, and the hole had made it sound deep and strange, not a bit like Andy's. Tom trembled and said nothing. He couldn't understand this queer voice suddenly coming into the cave, so Andy spoke again. Tom, it's Andy speaking. Are you there? The voice rumbled round the cave, but this time Tom was not so scared. He answered as loudly as he dared, "I'm here in the round cave." Tom's voice came up to Andy, all muddled and jumbled, for Tom was not near the opening of the hole. Andy couldn't make out what he said, but he knew it was Tom speaking. "Good," he thought. "Tom's in there, all right." So once more, Andy's voice came rumbling down into the cave. "Tom, I'm speaking down a hole that must lead to your cave. See if you can find it and speak up it." I can't hear you properly, but whatever you do, don't let anyone hear you speaking to me. Tom felt excited. Oh, good old Andy! He got up and began to hunt around for the hole that led upwards to Andy. He must find it. He simply must. He picked up the lamp, and hunted around the cave. As he was doing this, he heard the steps of the sentry coming up the rocky passage to the round cave. At once, Tom sat down and began to sing loudly the lullaby that was on the unbroken gramophone record. Hush, hush, hush! You mustn't say a word. It's time for hushaby, my little sleepy bird. These were the words of the rather silly lullaby song on the record, but they did very well indeed for a warning to Andy not to say anything for a moment. The sentry heard the boy singing, peeped in at him, said something that Tom didn't in the least understand, and went out again. He seemed surprised that the boy should sing. Tom went on singing the lullaby for a long time till he felt quite sure that the sentry wasn't coming back. Then he stopped singing, and hurriedly began to hunt for the hole. Andy's voice came booming down again. Tom, have you found the hole? 
The voice was so near Tom's ear that the boy nearly fell off the box he was standing on. He held up the lamp to the place where the voice came from. It was at the point where the roof and wall met at the back. The roof was of rock, but the wall, just there, was only of sand. Tom put his hand up and felt a cold draught blowing down the hole. Andy, I found the hole, he said, putting his head into it. I say, tell me what's happened. In low voices, the two boys told one another all that had happened. Well, Tom, the next thing to do is to rescue you, said Andy. I'm wondering if we can use this hall. What's it like at your end? Uh, rather small, said Tom. I couldn't get up it unless I could make it larger. What's it like at your end? Oh, I can easily make it as large as you like by scraping at it, said Andy. Can you make your end large too, do you think? Tom scraped at it with his hands. I might perhaps be able to, he said, but I'd want something to do it with. I've nothing but my hands. I've nothing but my hands either, and they're bleeding already from scraping at the soil. Listen, Tom, I shall go back to the girls soon, when the rocks are uncovered, but I can't wait till night. I must go now whilst the tide is low, so I want you to call to the sentry and pretend that you want his help in undoing a tin of food or something. See, then whilst he's in the cave with you, I'll creep over the rocks safely without being seen and get back. All right, said Tom. What will you do then? I'll collect something for us to work at the soil with, said Andy, and I'll bring it back tonight. Then maybe we can make the hole large enough for you to crawl up. Now wait until you hear my seagull call, Tom, then yell for the sentry. I'll make a dash for the rocks as soon as I see him going into the cave. Everything worked well. When Tom heard Andy's seagull cry, he shouted for the sentry, and the man went into the cave to see what was the matter. He found that Tom had got a large tin of tongue and seemed to have lost the tin opener. The sentry hadn't one either and spent a very long time trying to open the tin with his pocket knife. Andy had plenty of time to escape back over the rocks. He was back in the shack in no time, it seemed. The girls were thrilled to see him. When they heard about the hole leading down to the round cave, the girls were tremendously excited. So you see, finished Andy. I plan to get Tom out that way tonight, and I must take back with me something to dig and scrape with. Here's a bit of wood with some jolly big nails in it, all sticking out, said Jill. Would that do? Ah, yes, that's fine, said Andy. Is there a bit for Tom? They found an old bit that would do, and then Andy said such a funny thing. I'll take the gramophone too, and the one record. The girls stared at him. The gramophone, said Jill at last. Whatever for? Are you mad? Hey, well, it does sound rather mad, I know, said Andy, but I want it for something I'll tell you afterwards. The next night, after midnight, the boy went over the rocks again, carrying the pieces of rough wood with nails in, and the gramophone slung carefully over his shoulder. He reached the shore safely and made his way cautiously up the cliff, and very soon Tom, half asleep, heard the queer, hollow voice rumbling round his cave once more. Tom, are you asleep? Tom climbed on the chest and put his head to the hole. Hello, Andy, he said. I'm not asleep. I've been waiting and waiting for you. There's a bit of wood with nails in coming down the hole, said Andy. Scrape at your end with it and try your best to make the hole larger. I've got one too. I'll scrape my end. The two boys set to work. At last, Andy's hole was quite big enough to get into. He called softly to Tom. My end's big enough for you to get out. I've got a rope I can let down if you're ready. I'm nearly ready, answered Tom, scraping hard. Just a minute or two more. And then, at last, his end was large enough to climb into. Wait a minute, Tom, said Andy. I've got something I want to let down on the rope. It's the gramophone. The what? asked Tom in astonishment. The gramophone, said Andy. I'm afraid, Tom, you may make rather a noise climbing down the cliff, and the sentry might think you've escaped. But if I set the gramophone going, singing that silly lullaby you sang yesterday, he'll think it's you still in the cave and he won't come in to see what the matter is. So I'm going to let it down. And you must set it right and tie a bit of string to it so that I can pull the switch and set the record going when I think it's best to do. Golly, said Tom, you think of everything. The gramophone came bumping down the hole at the end of the rope. Tom put it carefully behind the big chest and set the needle ready on the outside edge of the record. He tied a long piece of string to the starting switch and then tied the other end to the rope that Andy had let down with the gramophone. Pull it up, 
Andy, he said. Andy drew up the rope, untied the string on that end of it, and tied it to a heavy stone for safety. Then he called to Tom. That's done. Come along up now. Here's the rope. Tie it around your waist, and I'll help you up the hole by pulling. And I say, don't forget your camera. Tom stood up on the highest chest and began to scramble up the hole. Andy hauled strongly at the rope, and Tom's head suddenly appeared through the hole by Andy's feet. Good, said Andy. Climb out. Tom climbed out. He sniffed the fresh breeze with delight, for it had been rather stuffy down in the cave. Now, you must get down the cliff as best you can without noise, he said. Wait for me at the edge of the rocks. Tom went to the cliff and began to climb down. Halfway down, he slipped and kicked out quickly to prevent himself from falling. A whole shower of stones fell down the cliff. The sentry, half dozing, shouted at once. Andy knew it was time to pull the string that was tied to the gramophone. He jerked it. The switch slid to one side and the record began to go round on its disc. The needle ran over the record and the lullaby began to sound in the cave. Hush, hush, hush. The sentry heard it and thought it was Tom singing. He felt satisfied that his prisoner was still in the cave as the song went on and settled himself down again in a comfortable position. Andy slipped down the cliff. Tom was waiting for him by the line of rocks. Didn't I make a row, he whispered, but I couldn't help it. Hey, it's all right. I set the record going and the sentry thinks you're busy in the cave singing yourself to sleep, said Andy in a low chuckle. Come on, we've no time to lose. Over the line of rocks, the boy slipped and climbed, Tom following Andy closely, for Andy knew the best way very well indeed. Big waves wet them, but they didn't care. All they wanted to do was to get back to the girls safely. They made their way to the shack. Mary and Jill were lying together on the heather bed in the darkness fast asleep. Mary heard the boys come in, and she sat upright in bed at once. Is that you, Andy? Yes, it's Tom too, said Andy. Jill awoke then, and the four of them sat on one bed, hugging one another for joy. There is only one thing to do, said Andy, and that is to get our fishing boat off the rocks early tomorrow morning and refloat her. I've noticed she seems to have moved a bit, and I, it may be that the tides have loosened her. Anyway, it's our only chance. Just before sunrise, the children slipped across the island and came to the beach where they'd first landed, after their wreck. They looked at the poor fishing boat still jammed between the rocks. Certainly it had moved a little, it was not leaning so much to one side. You see, Tom, she's not jammed very tightly now, and I reckon if we wait till the tide is at its very highest and big waves are trying to lift the boat up, we could pull her right off the rocks. Then we'll get her onto shore somehow and see what we can do. The children fastened strong double strands of rope to the front of the ship. Then, holding firmly to the rope, they clambered over the rocks back to the sandy beach, wet through. The tide came up higher and higher, and the children had to stand up to their waists in the water, for the rope would not reach right to the shore. Look, there is an enormous wave coming, shouted Andy. Pull on the rope, all of you. As soon as the wave strikes the ship, heave ho. They all pulled, and every child felt the ship give a little as the wave lifted her and the rope pulled her. Now, here's another one, yelled Andy. Heave ho. They all heaved at the rope with all their might. Again, they felt the ship move a little. The two big waves ran up the shore and wet the children to their chins. Hang on to the rope, girls, cried Andy. If we get many waves like that, you'll be swept off your feet. But as long as you've got hold of the rope, you'll be all right. Andy was sure that they could pull her in now. A green wave put up its head, and the children gave a yell. Look at that one! It'll knock us all over, said Mary, afraid. But she didn't let go of the rope. The wave grew bigger and higher as it came nearer to the rocks on which the boat lay. It began to curl over a little, and then it struck the rocks and the boat too. He heave ho! yelled Andy. The great wave blotted the boat from their sight and came raging towards them. Jill gave a shout of fear. Hold on! shouted Andy, half afraid himself. The wave swept them all off their feet and swept them all from the rope too, except Andy, who held on with all his might. The other three children were taken like corks, rolled over and over and flung roughly on the sand at the edge of the sea. Jill sat up, crying. Mary lay still, quite stunned for the moment. Tom sat up furiously angry at the wave. It had bumped and batted him most spitefully, he thought. As for Andy, he was underwater, still clinging to the rope. 
But as soon as he struggled to his feet, he gave a gurgling shout. The ship! Look! She's off and floating! They all looked, and there was the little fishing boat safely off the rocks, bobbing about on the sea that swirled high over the other rocks. Come in and help me quick, before any other big waves come. We can get her into the shore now. Quick, Tom! The three battered children, dripping wet, ran bravely into the sea again. They caught hold of the rope and pulled hard. Heave ho! Heave ho! Heave ho! chanted Andy as they pulled hard, and the boat came bobbing into the shore. We've got her! shouted Andy. We've got her! Now we'll just see what we can do. The four children were so excited at getting their boat off the rocks that at first they could do nothing but laugh and chatter and clap their hands. After a hurried breakfast, they all set out to work under Andy's orders. Andy stripped some of the wood from the roof of the cabin to use in the patching of the ship. The girls took out the old nails from the strips, and Tom waited on Andy and handed him everything he wanted. The sound of the hammer echoed over the island. Do you think the enemy will hear? asked Jill anxiously. Can't help if they do. We can't hammer without noise. Pass me the biggest nails you've got, Tom. They all worked steadily for the whole of the morning, and at last Andy heaved a sigh of relief. Is she ready? asked the girls eagerly. I as ready as I can make her. Now you girls must go and get all the rugs, and Tom, I'll get the food from where we buried it under the sand. We'll pile in everything we can, push her out into the water and sail off. Golly, I never thought we'd be able to do this. The four of them set off to fetch everything. They felt cheerful and excited. It was difficult climbing down the cliff so heavily laden, but they managed it safely. The girls threw down the rugs on the deck and the boys packed the food into the cabin. Now they could go. Wait a bit. We'll take the old sail with us, said Andy. He set off to get the sail and then he suddenly stopped and looked down on the beach. What is it, Andy, called Tom, seeing Andy's puzzled face. Look at this said Andy, picking up a dry, clean match that had already been struck. What about it? It's only a match, said Tom. It's a match that hasn't very long been struck, said Andy. I'm wondering if anyone has been here whilst we were fetching the rugs and the food. I don't like it. And oh golly, look at that set of footprints on the sand over there. They're not our footprints. The girls were frightened. Yes, someone had been on the beach whilst they had left to get the rugs and food. But who and where was he? Well, let's get the boat launched and hope to get away before we're stopped. Come on, we'll do it out the sail. They ran to the boat and took hold of the rope to drag it down to the sea. But even as they took hold of it, a loud voice shouted to them from round the corner of the cliff. Stop! Halt! The children stopped hauling the boat and stared round. They saw the enemy. Four of them. One of them was the man who spoke English, and it was he who was shouting. The children stared in fright at the four men who came quickly over the beach. They spoke to one another in a foreign language. Then the first man spoke again. So, there are four of you, and all children. We shall now take the boat away, and you shall remain prisoners on this island for as long as we want you to. Take out the food and blankets again. You will need those if you live here for months. The children sulkily took out all the food and rugs that they'd so cheerfully put into the boat. Now we are going said the man who spoke English. Andy and the others had to watch the men drag their ship down to the sea and launch it. They tied their little rowing boat behind it and now, waving mockingly to the children, they made their way over the water, round the cliff and out of sight, rowing Andy's boat along swiftly. The children watched them go, anger and despair in their hearts, all their work for nothing. Wearily they gathered up the old rugs and the food and made their way up the cliff across the island and back to their shack. They packed the food on the floor in a corner and threw the rugs on the beds. Then they sat down on the beds and looked at one another. Not till then did the girls begin to cry, but cry they did, letting the tears run down their cheeks without trying to wipe them off. They were so tired and so disappointed. Tears came into Tom's eyes too when he saw the two miserable girls, but he blinked them back after one look at Andy's lean brown face. Andy was angry and fierce, and he sat in silence, looking straight before him, thinking hard. Andy, what are you thinking about? asked Tom at last. You look so stern. You're not angry with us, are you? No, no. We did our best. We've got to do our best again. I tell you, Tom, we've got to leave this island. Somehow we've got to get away and tell our secret. 
Well, my idea is we'd better make a raft. We can't get a boat or make one, but we could make a rough kind of raft and get a mast of some sort to rig a sail on. We've plenty of food to take with us, and you and I, Tom, could set off alone to try and make for home. I didn't take the girls. They'd be so cold in an open raft, and they'd be safer here. Not take us? cried Jill indignantly. Of course you'll take us. We won't be left behind, will we, Mary? Listen, Jill, you're only ten years old and not very big, said Andy patiently. If we take you, it'll make things much more difficult for Tom and me. If we get home safely, we can have you rescued at once. If we don't get home, at least you'll be safe on the island. The girls cried bitterly at this. They thought it was very unfair. But Andy was quite firm about it, and the girls dried their eyes and listened to his plans. We shall have to pull our wooden hut to pieces and use the planks. Luckily, we've got plenty of nails to use. But what shall we live in if we pull down the shack? asked Jill in dismay. I have thought of that. We could make it look as if our hut had fallen down on us, and I could ask the enemy to give us a tent to live in instead. Then we could live in that and quietly make a raft from the fallen down shack. That really is a good idea, said Tom. The enemy will actually help us without knowing it. Yes, said Andy, grinning. We'd better wait a day or two, though, because the enemy are bound to keep a watch on us a bit at first, to see if we've any other ideas to escape. So for the next few days, the children just played about, bathing, fishing, paddling, and the enemy who sent a man over every day at noon saw nothing to make him think that the children had any plans at all. I think there's going to be a storm, said Andy, on the third evening. That would be a good reason for our shack to fall down, I think. The man came, looked round the island and went. As soon as he'd gone, the children set about the hut. Next day, when the man came to look at the children and go over the island as usual, he was surprised to find Jill bandaged up and Andy limping. Andy hailed him. Hi! Our shack has fallen down. We want a tent to sleep in. The man didn't understand. Tom took out his notebook and drew a tent in it. Then the man understood. He nodded his head and said something that sounded like, Yah, yah, to the children and set off in his boat. I hope he comes back with a tent, said Tom. You'd better go up the cliff, Jill, and sit at the top, so that if the man comes back he won't ask to see your head. Jill and Mary went off. Tom and Andy waited for the man to return. He came back in about three hours and he brought a tent. The boys were pleased. The man looked round for the girls and touched his head and looked at Andy. He was trying to say he wanted to see the girl with a bandaged head. Andy nodded and pointed to the top of the cliff. And she's all right now. The man saw the girl sitting up on the cliff and seemed satisfied. He put the tent down on the beach, showed Andy the ropes and pegs with it and went off again in his boat. Good, said Andy. We'll put this tent up in a sheltered place in the next cove. We don't want the man visiting this hollow too often or he might notice that the shack is gradually disappearing. The man came again next day, and Andy showed him where they'd put the tent. This time, he brought a large supply of food, and he tried to make the children understand that he would not be back for a few days. He pointed to three fingers and shook his head. I think he means he won't be back for three days, said Andy, his heart jumping for joy. He nodded to the man, who, instead of looking over the island as he usually did, got straight back into his boat and rowed off. Well, if that isn't a bit of luck, said Andy joyfully as soon as he'd gone, I'm sure he won't be back for some days, and he's brought us a marvellous supply of food. That will do just beautifully for the raft. We can safely begin building this afternoon. The building of the raft occupied them for two days, but at last it was ready to be launched. The raft was dragged right down to the sea. In the middle of it, Andy fixed a post that was to be the mast. He rigged up the old sail very cleverly. The box of food was firm below the mast. They had enough to last for some days. Andy made two rough paddles to help the boat along and to guide it. The girls handed the boys the two warmest rugs to wrap themselves in at night, though Andy said they wouldn't be of any use. They'd get wet with the very first wave that splashed over the raft. But to please the girls, he took the rugs. The raft was ready to float off at last. The boys gave the girls a hug and said goodbye. Now don't worry, said Andy, jumping onto the raft. You won't hear for days and days because we've got to get back home and then tell our tale and send ships that have got to find their way here, so you'll have to wait a long time. What shall we say if the enemy want to know where you are? Jill asked anxiously. Just say, we've disappeared. All right, said Jill. Anyway, you may be quite sure we shan't tell them you've gone off on a raft. 
No, we don't want their seaplanes hunting the seas for us, said Andy, letting the sail unfurl. Now goodbye, Jill. Goodbye, Mary. See you soon. Goodbye, Andy. Goodbye, Tom, cried the girls, trying to smile cheerfully, though they felt very miserable and lonely to see the boys setting off together. Good luck. Tom pushed out the raft and jumped up on it. He took a paddle and guided it. Andy let the sail billow out and the wind caught it and the little raft leapt along over the waves like a live thing. I say, it can get along, can't it? cried Jill, jumping up and down with excitement. Look how it bobs over the waves. The boys looked back at the shore of their island, which now seemed far away. They could just make out the two girls who'd now climbed to the top of the cliff and were standing there watching the raft out of sight. I hope Jill and Mary will be all right, said Tom. Poor kids. It was awful having to leave them alone. Yes, but it was the only thing to be done. Do you really know which way to go, Andy, said Tom. Or more or less, I can guide the raft by the sun in the daytime and by the stars at night. It's a good thing for us the wind is just in the right direction. I hope it lasts. It's easy now, but if the wind changes, things will be very difficult. Now the boys could no longer see any land at all. They were alone on the wide green sea. Below them, the water was very, very deep. They opened a tin of salmon and a tin of pears and had a good meal, though Tom longed for some bread with the salmon. It was odd sitting there eating on the bobbing raft, all by themselves in the midst of a wide heaving sea. The day seemed endless, but at last the sun slid down the sky and the sea turned from green to purple in the twilight. It's not so warm now, said Tom, taking his jersey down from the mast. Tom, see if you can have a nap for a while. I don't think we ought to both sleep at once. The wind might change or a storm might blow up. You sleep now, and I'll have a nap later. Tom wrapped himself in a rug and tried to go to sleep. Andy slipped a rope round his waist and tied him to the box in the middle. Hey, you might roll off the raft in the middle of the night, he said with a grin. I shouldn't like to look around and find you gone, Tom. Tom slept. He dreamt he was on a swing, going up and down, up and down in the air. It was very pleasant. Then he dreamt he was being scolded by Jill for something, and she suddenly threw a pail of cold water right over him. He woke with a jump and sat up. Did that wave wake you? said Andy with a grin. I thought it would. It popped its head up, saw you asleep, and jumped right on top of you. Tom laughed and lay down again. Andy woke Tom near dawn and told him to sit up and keep watch. The wind's still right. Watch it, Tom. You can see the North Star, can't you? I'm so sleepy I can't stay awake much longer. Andy tied himself up safely, lay down, and was asleep as his head touched the rug that made a pillow for him. Tom sat and watched the dawn coming. It was a wonderful sight. First the sky turned to silver, and the sea turned to silver too. Soon a pink flush came into the eastern sky, and then it changed to a blaze of gold. The sea sparkled and glinted with gold too. After a while, Tom felt very hungry. He burrowed in the box of food to see what was there, picked out a tin of tongue and opened it. It smelt delicious. Andy woke up after a while and shared the meat with Tom. They opened some pineapple and had that too. The juice was very pleasant. Andy sniffed the wind and looked at the sky. Oh, I'm afraid the wind is changing. We shall be blown right out of our way if it does. The sea's getting very rough, Tom. I think we'd both better tie ourselves firmly to the mast. It won't do for either of us to be thrown off the raft, and a big wave could easily wash one of us overboard. So they tied themselves to the mast, and then watched the scurrying clouds, wondering if they would suddenly slow down and fly the other way. Alas, for Tom and Andy, the wind did change, and blew strongly the other way. Andy took down the sail hurriedly. Hey, we don't want to be blown back to our island, he said. Towards afternoon, the wind dropped again and the sun shone out. What a relief that was. Andy rigged the sail again. We'll get the wind we want this evening. We'll be ready for it. Sure enough, as the sun slid down the western sky and the wind got up again, and this time it was blowing from the right quarter, Andy was delighted. The sail flapped and the little raft raced along nobly. The sun was just about to slip over the skyline when Andy sat up straight and looked alarmed. Can you hear a noise? he asked Tom. Plenty, said Tom. The wind, the waves, the sail. No, no, not that sort of a noise. A noise like a seaplane. Tom's heart almost stopped beating. He sat and listened. Yes, there's a seaplane out there somewhere. Blow. 
If it's really hunting for us, it'll be sure to find us, just as we've got away so nicely too and the wind helping us again and all. Tom went pale and looked at the sky anxiously, and then the seaplane appeared, flying fairly low and quite slowly. It was plain that it was hunting the seas for something. Can't we do anything, Andy, said Tom. Uh, we'd better jump into the water, hold on to the raft, and hope that maybe the seaplane will think there's no one on it. Only our heads will show besides the raft. They may not notice them. Come on, quick. The boys slid into the water over the side of the raft. They hung there with their hands, only their heads showing. The great seaplane came zooming overhead, very close to the water. It had seen the raft and was coming to examine it more closely. The plane flew over the raft. It circled round and came back again, flying once more over the raft. It circled round again, and the boys hoped that it would fly off, but once more it flew over the raft. And then, to the boys' great dismay, it skimmed over the water and landed there, not far off. It's no good, Tom. We're discovered. We may as well climb back onto the raft. Look, they're letting down a boat. The boys climbed back onto the raft, angry and disappointed. And then Tom gave such a tremendous yell that Andy nearly fell overboard with fright. Andy! Andy! Look at the sign on the seaplane! It's British! It's British! The boat from the seaplane came nearer. It had two men in it, and they hailed the boys. Ahoy there! Where are you from? Ahoy there! yelled back Andy. Ahoy there! He was too excited to shout anything else. The boat came alongside the raft, and the men pulled the two boys into it. Why, it's only a couple of boys, said one man. We reckon you might be men from a sunken ship or an aeroplane. How did you get here? It's a long tale to tell. I think I'd better tell it to the chief if you don't mind. All right, the commander's in the plane, said the first man. They rode off to the seaplane and left the little raft, bombing about on the sea alone. Tom was quite sorry to see it go. The boat reached the enormous seaplane. The boys were pushed up into it, and a grave-faced man turned to receive them. And then Andy got a second shot. For Tom once more let out a yell that really scared him. Daddy! Oh, Daddy, it's you! The grey-faced man stared at Tom as if he couldn't believe his eyes. Then he took the boy into his arms and gave him such a bear-like hug that Tom felt as if his bones would break. Tom! We've been hunting for you ever since we heard that you'd gone off in that boat and hadn't come back, he said. Where are the girls? Quick, tell me. They're safe, said Tom. We left them on the island. They're quite safe. Oh, Daddy, isn't this too good to be true? Daddy, this is Andy. We never would have escaped if it hadn't been for him. What do you mean, escaped? said Tom's father in surprise. Escaped from what? We've got a big secret to tell you, said Tom. We found out something queer. You tell him, Andy. Well, sir, we got thrown off up the coast to some desolate islands where nobody lives now. The enemy are using them for the submarines and seaplanes. There are caves stored with food, and there must be stores of fuel there somewhere. What? shouted Tom's father. He called his men near, and they all listened to Andy's tale. The boy told it well. And we were just escaping on the raft we'd made when we saw you, finished Andy. We slipped over the side of the raft to hide, but you must have seen us. Uh, we didn't, said Tom's father, but we were puzzled about the empty raft and came down to examine it. This seaplane and two others have been scouring the seas about here, looking for the sailing ship you went off in. We were afraid you might be drifting about in it, half starving. Your poor mother has been dreadfully upset. Oh dear, I was afraid she would be, said Tom. But never mind, we're all safe, Daddy. At least, I hope the girls are safe. They will be very soon, said the boy's father in a grim voice. We'll rescue them and clean up those submarines and seaplanes in no time. You've done a marvellous thing, Tom and Andy. Well, I hope my father won't be very angry with me for losing his boat, though he might perhaps be able to get it back from the enemy now. Your father won't be angry with you for anything once he sees you're safe, and hears the tale you've just told me, said Tom's father. Settle down now, we're going up. With a great noise of engines, the seaplane skimmed over the water and then rose gracefully in the air. She shot away southwards and the boys looked out over the sea, which was now far below. Well, what luck to be rescued like this, said Andy. And oh, Tom, what a shot the enemy are going to get. The two girls felt very lost and lonely when the boys went off on the raft. They waved until the raft was a tiny speck on the sea. Then they lost sight of it. It was gone. I do hope Tom and Andy reach home all right, said Jill.
as they made their way down the cliff to the shore again. It would be awful if they got lost on the sea. Don't say things like that, said Mary. Let's think of something cheerful. Let's have something to eat. But neither of them really wanted anything. They kept thinking of the two brave boys on their little raft. The girls lit their little stove and put it just at the tent opening when night came. They liked to see the small light it gave. They boiled a kettle of water on it and sat inside the tent, drinking hot cocoa whilst the stars came out in the sky. As they were about to curl up and go to sleep, they heard the sound of a seaplane droning overhead. It came over the island twice and then went away. And then about an hour later, the girls heard the noise of a motorboat. It grounded on the sand of the cove and the girls heard men's voices. Good gracious, said Jill, sitting up in alarm. What are they coming here at this time of night for? Quick, Mary, get up. We'll slip out of the tent and go into the bracken. Maybe we can pretend we've been roaming over the island and they'll think the boys are somewhere about too. The girls left the tent and ran into the heather and bracken in the middle of the small island. The men left their boat on the beach and two of them came up to the tent. They lifted the flap of the tent and flashed a torch inside. One of the men called out loudly, Now, you children, where are you? Uh, here, answered Jill. She nudged Mary. You shout too, she whispered. Then I'll shout again, and they'll think we're all here. Uh, we're here, yelled Mary valiantly, though her heart was beating hard. In the bracken, shouted Jill. Come along down here, commanded the man. We shall have to go, said Jill. Now don't you give the boys away, Mary. Pretend they're out and about somewhere. The girls made their way to the men who flashed a light on them. Where are the boys? demanded the man. Haven't you seen them? asked Jill. They must be about somewhere. Maybe they're in the tent. Have you looked? Yes, said the man. Now look here. What do you mean by lighting this stove out here? Are you trying to signal to anyone? Of course not, said Jill. We only made some hot cocoa, that's all. Look, there are our dirty cups. She wished she'd not said this when the man looked for the cups, for he saw at once that there were only two. He looked at Jill suspiciously. Why did the boys not have the cocoa? he asked. Well, they weren't here when we made it, said Jill. Why don't you go and look for them? The man turned out the stove, and the light flickered and went out. Now don't you dare to show lights at night, he said. If I think you are signalling to anyone, you'll be very sorry. Who could we signal to? asked Jill. We don't even know where we are. The man took no notice of her. He stood and shouted into the night. Boys! Come here at once! There was no answer, of course. They couldn't be, for the boys were miles away at sea. Tomorrow I will come and tell those boys that when I call, they must answer, said the man in an angry voice. I'm going now, but tomorrow I will come again. You will tell the boys they must be here by the tent. Neither of the girls could imagine what the men would do when they came to find the boys the next day and saw they were gone. They cuddled up together and tried to go to sleep. They woke early and got themselves some breakfast. Then they sat, waiting for the men. The motorboat didn't arrive until midday. Then two men came up to the tent, and the one who could speak English looked at the two girls. What about those boys? he said. Why are they not here? I don't know, said Jill. Where are they? I don't know, said Jill again, quite truthfully. You don't know? You don't know? said the man in disgust. It is time you did know. Are they on this island? Why don't you look and see, said Jill. I'm sure you'll not believe what I say, so you better look. The men went to the ruined buildings and looked around carefully. It didn't take them long to see that the boys had pulled the old shack to pieces. So, said the first man, the boys tried to make a boat. Jill and Mary shook their heads. It is a raft they made then, asked the man. What? You will not tell me? Then I shall order out my seaplanes and they will find those bad boys and bring them back again. And you will all be made prisoners on the other island until we take you far away to our country where will you stay for a long time. The men left in their motorboat, leaving two miserable girls behind them. Oh, I do hope they won't catch poor Andy and Tom, wept Mary. It's too bad. Now they'll hunt all over the sea till they find them, and they'll catch us tomorrow too and take us all away. Well, they just won't take me away, said Jill, drying her eyes fiercely. I shall give them a good old hunt for me. I shall go to the second island and hide in the food cave. 
So will I, said Mary, dabbing her eyes fiercely too. We'll wait till the tide goes down, and then we'll clamber over the rocks. So when the tide was low that day, the two girls clambered hurriedly over the line of rocks that led from one island to the next, and came to the sandy beach. Not far off was the entrance to the cave that led up to the round cave. Nobody's seen us, said Mary, as they ran up to the cave. We'll hide here and make the enemy think we've escaped from the island too. Perhaps they'll be so busy looking for us that they'll forget about the boys. Uh, I don't think they'll forget Andy and Tom, said Jill, making her way up the passage to the round cave. Look, Mary, this chest is almost empty. Let's take out the tins and things that are left and get inside. We can shut the lid down on us if we hear anyone coming. The girls got the chest ready and then amused themselves by trying to find the funnel opening that led from the cave to the surface of the cliff above, but they couldn't find it. I wonder if it's night yet, said Mary, for it was impossible to tell in the dark cave. I vote we make a nice soft bed in the sandy floor, said Jill. We can cover ourselves with those empty sacks, and in the morning we'll peep out and see if we can see anything. So they made sandy beds and threw the sacks over themselves. They fell fast asleep and didn't wake till morning. And then... When they went to peep out of the shore cave, they had a great surprise. Coming gracefully down the smooth water was an enormous seaplane droning like a great bumblebee. It's coming to get us, squealed Mary in fright, and the two girls scuttled back into the round cave. If only the girls had stopped to look carefully at that seaplane, they would have noticed that it bore the signs of their own country. It was the very same seaplane that had rescued Tom and Andy. It had flown to headquarters, had made its report, and had handed Tom's camera in. As soon as the pictures had been developed and the seaplane and submarine photographs had come out clearly, there was great excitement. Tom and Andy had been questioned closely. Well, you have stumbled on an astonishing secret, said one man who'd been listening. We're proud of you. Now we shall be able to spring a real surprise on our enemy and clean up all the submarines and seaplanes that have been worrying our shipping for some time. Please, sir... What about my sisters? asked Tom anxiously. Will you get them away before you do anything? The men laughed heartily. Of course, said one. That'll be our first job. You don't really suppose we should forget those two plucky little girls, do you? Oh, no. We shall send your father's seaplane to rescue them. And after that, <laughs> a big surprise will come to those islands. The boys grinned. May we see the surprise, sir? asked Andy. No, said the man. It'll be a bit noisy. He turned to Tom's father and gave him a few quick orders. Come along, said the boy's father. You and Andy must come with me to the island so that you may tell me quickly where the girls are. We have to get them off before we attack the enemy, and I'd like to do it as quickly as possible before anyone knows we've discovered their secret. The girls were hiding inside the chest when they heard footsteps coming up the passageway that led from the shore cave to the round cave. They lay there trembling wondering when they were going to be discovered. Tom led his father into the cave. Look, he said, do you see all these boxes and chests, Daddy? They're absolutely full of food of all sorts. I can tell you it came in handy when we were so hungry. Tom stopped. A queer noise was coming from a big chest nearby. He stared in surprise. What's that noise? said Tom's father at once. I don't know, said Tom. Listen. The girls inside the chest had heard Tom's voice, and they were quite mad with joy and excitement, but they couldn't lift up the lid of the chest, which they'd carefully shut down over themselves. There's something in that chest, said Tom in a trembling voice. Is it the enemy playing a trick? We'll soon see, said his father in a fierce voice. He rapped out an order to the two men with him, and they went over to the chest. They ripped off the lid, and everyone stood ready to fight the enemy. But it was two small, excited, and most untidy little girls who rose up from the chest, shouting loudly, Tom! Andy! It's us! We hid here because we thought you were the enemy! Their father picked them out of the chest and hugged them. They were as surprised as he was. They simply couldn't believe their eyes. Daddy, it's you! However did you get here? Oh, Tom, Andy, you've come to rescue us just in time. Oh, what a good thing you came to the cave! Jill and Mary told their tale, their words tumbling over one another. When their father heard that the enemy guessed that the boys had left on a raft, he hustled them all out of the cave very quickly.
We'll get back to our plane, he said. We shall get into a spot of trouble if the enemy sees us here. If they really think the boys have gone to tell their secret, they'll be watching for us, though not expecting us quite so soon. Come along. They all rode off to the seaplane. Goodbye, little islands, said Jill, watching them get smaller and smaller as the plane left them behind. We've had lots of adventures on you, but I'm very glad to leave you all the same. The seaplane flew over the water and at last came to the shores of the little fishing village where Andy lived and the other children had been staying. It glided down to the water and rested there, its great wings spread out beside it. The little beach was soon crowded with people, fishermen and their wives, children, visitors, all shouting and cheering. The news had gone round that the four missing children had been found. A boat set off to fetch the children from the plane. It was rowed by Andy's father. How Andy shouted to see him. Dad, we're back again. The bearded man in the boat smiled and waved. He'd been terribly worried about Andy and the children, but now his heart was glad. They were safe. The children tumbled into the boat, all talking at once. The people on the beach cheered and shouted. Everyone wanted to shake hands and say how glad they were to see the children back. And then the children saw their mother. They rushed to her and hugged her like bears, shouting and laughing. Now, now, give me a look in, said their father, smiling, and the whole family went up the beach together. Andy went off with his father. He had no mother, so he thought twice as much of his father. What a talking and chattering there was that evening. Well, I'm proud of you all, said their mother, hugging them. But, oh, I was so awfully worried when you didn't come back. I sent a message to your father, and he came in his seaplane and hunted for you for days. He wouldn't give up hunting, and it's a good thing he didn't, for he found you just in time. You and Andy would never, never have got home on that little raft, you know, Tom. Wouldn't we? said Tom, surprised. I thought we really might. I don't think Andy thought there was much hope, said the children's father, but he knew it was your only chance, and he knew, besides, that it was his duty to tell someone the great secret you'd discovered. It means a lot to our country to know the secret of those desolate little islands. There was a dull, booming sound as the children's father finished speaking. Tom looked at his father. Are those guns? he asked. Yes, it'll be the end of those hateful submarines, said his father gravely. There'll be no more of our ships sunk without warning by that nest of submarines. The children were silent as they listened to the guns booming far away again. They were all imagining the islands echoing to the terrific sound of gunfire. Mary began to cry. Her father put his arm around her. Yes, Mary, he said. It is something to cry about. To think that we have to fight so much evil and wickedness. But dry your eyes. You're on the right side, and this is something to be proud of. Andy came tearing up to the cottage. I say, he yelled. Did you hear the guns? I guess they're waking up the islands. Andy, was your father angry about his fishing boat being lost? asked Tom. He hasn't said a word about it, said Andy. Not a word. He's been fine about it. We're going to fish with my uncle now that we've lost our own boat. Maybe one day we'll save enough money to get a boat again. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, said Tom's father unexpectedly. I rather think there's a surprise coming for you tomorrow. Oh, what? cried all the children. Wait and see, was the answer. So they had to wait, and the next day the surprise arrived. Andy saw it first. He was on the beach mending nets, and the other children were helping him. Andy happened to look up, and he saw a fishing boat round the corner of the cliff. Hello, said Andy. Whose boat is that? I haven't seen it before. My word, what a smart one. Look at its red sail. It came into the beach, and a man jumped out. He saw the children and hailed them. Hi, give a hand here. I've got to find the owner, said the man. It's for the boy whose name has been given to the boat. The children looked at the name on the boat. There, painted boldly, was Andy's own name. Andy. Andy! The boat is called Andy, squealed Jill. Oh, Andy, does that mean it's for you? Andy stared at the boatman in astonishment and joy. It can't be for me, he said. Well, if you're Andy, it's yours, said the boatman. I understand that it's a little reward from the government for good services. Wasn't it you who discovered the secret of those islands and lost your own boat in doing so? Golly, said Andy, and could say no more. He stood and stared at the lovely boat in delight and pride. It was the finest in the bay. It was beautiful all over. 
Never, never could Andy ever have had enough money to buy a boat like this. Many people had come down to the beach to look at the fine new fishing boat. Andy's father and uncle came running down, and when they heard the news, they couldn't believe their ears. Andy's father got into the boat and looked at it carefully, his blue eyes gleaming with joy. Aye, Andy lad, he said. This is a boat fit for a king himself, if he wanted to go fishing. We'll go out on the tide this evening and do a wee bit of fishing together, and you must write to the king and his government to thank them for the bonny present. It was most generous of them. Andy wasn't a good writer, so Tom wrote the letter for him and posted it. And then Andy, his father, and the three children all got into the fishing boat that evening to go on the first trip together. The red sail billowed out against the sky as the evening breeze filled it. Like a sea bird, the little boat bobbed gracefully on the water and then raced away on the tide. The Andy was away on her first trip. Now don't get lost on any more adventures, shouted the children's father who'd come down to the beach to watch. Just go fishing now and bring me back something I can eat for breakfast, not submarines and seaplanes.